part of this international webinar. Over to Dr. Lipika Mondol. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Dr. Shukanta Ghosh, uh, convener of this program, of today's program. Uh, very, good, uh, very good morning to all. Hope you all are fit and fine in this pandemic situation. On the auspicious occasion to commemorate the 75th anniversary of India's independence, Ajadika Amrit Mahotsav, Women's Study Cell, COP, NSS Unit 1 of the Kojbihar College, and Boshundara Eco Club, NSS Unit 1, 2, and 3 of Bilda College, in association with IQSC of both of, of the college, have jointly organized the international webinar entitled Restoration of Ecology, Environmental Benefits, and Sustainability. Ecosystem restoration is the process of assisting the recovery of ecosystem that has been degraded, damaged, and destroyed. Many of the world's ecosystems have undergone sufficient degradation with, ne with negative impacts of biological diversity and people's livelihoods. There is a growing realization that we will not be able to conserve the Earth's biological diversity through the protection of critical areas alone. At present, ecosystem restoration is an important component of conservation and sustainable development programs. By this way, the livelihoods of the people of the earth can be sustained. Ecosystem restoration is thus a significant contribution to the application of the ecosystem approach. That is, in the uh, informing the negotiations of land use options and enhancement the hearty, uh, healthy ecological networks. Ecological restoration and rare species management in response to recent climate change is the key phenomena of ecological conservation and restoration programs and future sustainability of this planet. The unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic has had major impact on human health worldwide. While least national and international COVID-19 lockdown and travel restrictions measures have had the beneficial effect on the environment, reducing air, water pollution, as well as ecological restoration process. We are eagerly waiting to listen our eminent speakers today regarding these issues. Now, <clears throat> I bid a very warm welcome to all the dignitaries and delegates and all the participants who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this international webinar. It is my great pleasure to extend our warm welcome to the chief patron of today's program and honorable vice chancellor of Kojbihar Panchanan Burma University, Professor Devnarayan Mukhopadhyay. Welcome you, sir. I feel delighted to welcome uh, today's guest of honor, Dr. Abdul Kader Salfi, Registered Kojbihar Panchanan Burma University. Welcome you, sir, in, the, in our program. I extend my heartly welcome to the chief guest of today's program, Mr. Binay Kumar, Regional Director, RDNSS Kolkata, Government of India. It's my great pleasure to have with us Dr. Pankaj Kumar Devnath, patron of today's program and principal of Kojbihar College. I convey my thanks to, uh, Prince, uh, to Principal Sir of Kojbihar College for give us this opportunity to organize this joint venture. I extend my warm welcome to Professor Amol Kumar Har, NSS Program Coordinator, Kojbihar Panchanan Burma University. I extend my heartly welcome to Dr. Manavendra Mundal, Chairperson of today's webinar and Principal of Belda College, who encourage us for conducting this program. Welcome you, sir. I would like to uh, extend my special thanks to the uh, to Mridul Ghosh, IQSC coordinator, uh, Dr. Mridul Ghosh, IQSC coordinator, Kojbihar College, and Dr. Ashit Ponda, coordinator, IQSC Bilda College, and all the members of uh, IQSC of both the college for organizing this program. I heartily welcome to Dr. Shukanta Ghosh, convener of today's program. I would like to convey my heartfelt thanks to 
the honorable speakers of today's program uh, mr richard kerej dr shukolan chakraborty uma shankar mondol for accepting our invitation and providing their valuable times amid their busy schedule welcome you sir i extend my warm welcome to dr swetama mishra dr sahil choudhury mr shubhir saha and all the members of organizing committee of both of our college i would like to offer my warm welcome to our uh, beloved nss volunteers and students and all the participants thank you each and every one for being here with us today we welcome everybody in our program over to you dr shukant ghosh uh, thank you dr lipika uh, thank you dr lipika mondol dno uh, poshim medinipur nss po and iqc member and hod department of geography belda college west bengal india for his uh, valuable speech i will say that uh, it starts uh, it, it can reflects uh, what are the, our thoughts and what are our uh, ideas that uh, we have choose this topic thank you ma'am for elaborating all this uh, topic also and thank you and uh, now i would like to welcome uh, shubhi sir our respected vice chancellor is with us uh doc um, professor dev kumar mukhopadhyay sir is with us okay i'm check now sir is uh, actually sir is busy today he is he is traveling so uh, we, we are hoping it will be great uh, pleasure for us professor dev kumar mukhopadhyay honorable vice chancellor Coach Bihar Panchanun Board, my university, Coach Bihar West Bengal. No, I think sir is not there. Okay, okay. Then uh, it's okay. Then uh, we have same uh, uh, situation with the Dr. Abdul Kadir Safili, Honorable Register. Uh, he is also busy with his university work and busy schedule. Uh, now I would like to welcome our uh, patron. of this international webinar and the uh, principal of coach bihar college dr pankaj kumar devnath uh, sir uh, please uh, uh, say something in this occasion of international webinar over to dr pankaj kumar devnath so very uh, good morning to all of you present here so today uh Kujbihar College and requesting listeners please be with us sir may have some technical problem please be with us i think sir is muted now ha uh, sir may may have sir may have uh, internet problem or uh, anything network sir is uh, with us okay okay sir sorry there is a uh, network problem uh, so kuch bhi are college in association with Belda College. Uh, we are organizing an international webinar on restoration of ecology, environmental benefits, and sustainability for commemorating 75 years of independence. Ajadi ka Amrit Mahotsav. So this is really a very golden opportunity for all of us, for all the stakeholders of uh, both the colleges, uh, the main uh, organizers of. the colleges are om study cell cop nss unit 2 of kujbihar college and bosudhara eco club and nss unit of belda college in association with iqc of both the colleges so uh, first of all i would like to uh, thank our respected vice chancellor professor dev kumar mukhopadhyay who is really busy today who is traveling uh, from kolkata to kujbihar now so 
so he is not available otherwise he is always available with our all the programs he is a supporting guide also so we are missing you sir and uh, other uh, guest the registrar of kujbihar panjabur university uh, duties personal and other official work he is also not able to join this program uh, but they are very always cooperative and without their help we could not um, conduct any program it is not possible to conduct so anyway they are now busy so we are missing you both your know, both of you i think uh, mr binoy kumar the regional director the chief guest of this program will uh, uh, deliver his speech definitely because he will be traveling today from calcutta to uh, kuchbihar tomorrow there is a program in our college and um, just few minutes back i have a talk uh, with him and he will be joining definitely i think so dr shukanto can confirm it because his train is at 3:30 so i think he will be available uh, uh, so uh, i also like to congratulate uh, from uh, both our college uh, mr binay kumar the uh, regional director of nss of west bengal uh, i would like to thank from the core of my heart and from all the stakeholders of both the colleges the uh, honorable speakers uh, from united kingdom richard carriage who is the coordinator of research and graduate studies in the humanities bathspa university sir uh, we are really grateful to you uh for your helping hand and for your cooperation and accepting our request from india and uh, definitely this will shows uh, a very uh, good relations uh, with our country and your country sir thank you sir pranam from our part so uh, i think the uh, listeners will be definitely benefited especially the nss volunteers uh, will get uh, some information and definitely some valuable uh, insight uh, of this um, international webinar of the main topic from you sir so i again welcome you from our part sir uh, i also like to welcome uh, dr sukollan chakraborty uh, who is also a speaker uh, of today's webinar uh, who is associate professor department of civil and environmental engineering bit mesra Uh, so he is also a prominent person in this field uh, uh, another uh, practical man uh, which is very much related in this um, today's topic of uh, international webinar uh, known as mangrove man mr uma shankar mandal so both of you he is from practical part uh, practical field so definitely his experience will uh, be shared by him and we will all be benefited all the uh, members present here so i think that uh, uh, today's webinar uh, will be a very successful one i will not take much more time because uh, time um, is very precious today actually a uh, sar is uh, will be leaving very shortly so uh, thank you again all of you uh, so over to shukant Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pankaj Kumar Devnar, uh, respected principal, Kodh Bihar College, uh, for his valuable and uh, enlightful um, lecture. And uh, for the uh, from very first day when we uh, uh, want to organize that type of uh, international webinar, and uh, we discuss about that our principals uh, of two colleges are uh, they are the real uh, inspiration, and without them. it's not possible and our principal sir is also uh, like this and he always uh, inspire us always motivate us to do that type of program so sir on uh, on this occasion of international uh, webinar azadi ka mahotsav we are also um, uh, celebrating with this nss and women study cell we are really thankful to you because you are also busy person but uh, you are with us as a uh, guardian So thank you, sir, on behalf of our, uh, of our organizing committee. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
সুবির স্যার আওয়ার রেসপেক্টেড রিজনাল ডিরেক্টর মিস্টার বিনয় কুমার স্যার ইজ উইথ আস অর নট আই থিং আই থিং নট अगेन আই এম চেকিং রাইট অমল কুমার হোর প্রোগ্রাম কোয়ার্ডিনেটর কোচবিহার পঞ্চানন বর্মা ইউনিভার্সিটি কোচবিহার অমল বাবু ইজ উইথ আস অর নট অমল কুমার হোর অমল কুমার হোর প্রফেসর অমল কুমার নাও আই উড লাইক টু ওয়েলকাম ডক্টর মৃদুল ঘোষ আইকিউসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর কোচবিহার কলেজ ওয়েস্ট বেঙ্গল ইন্ডিয়া ডক্টর মৃদুল ঘোষ আইকিউসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর কোয়ার্ডিনেটর আজকে আমাকে শোনা যাচ্ছে নিশ্চয়ই আমি একটা অন্য জায়গায় রয়েছি তবু তার মধ্যে এই অনুষ্ঠানে অংশগ্রহণ করতে পেরে ভালো লাগছে এবং আমি আজকে জাস্ট কোচবিহার কলেজের আইকিউএসির তরফ থেকে এই অনুষ্ঠানের সমস্ত আয়োজক এবং যারা অংশগ্রহণ করছেন প্রত্যেককে আইকিউএসির তরফ থেকে অভিনন্দন জানাচ্ছি স্বাগতম জানাচ্ছি এখানে বহু গুণী মানুষ দেশ বিদেশ থেকে উপস্থিত রয়েছেন উপস্থিত রয়েছেন কোচবিহার কলেজের অধ্যক্ষ এবং বেলদা কলেজের অধ্যক্ষ এবং দুই কলেজেরই আইকিউএসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর কনভেনার এবং আমাদের সঙ্গে থাকবার কথা ছিল কোচবিহার পঞ্চানন বর্মা বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের উপাচার্য সম্মানীয় দেবকুমার মুখোপাধ্যায় মহাশয় এবং রেজিস্ট্রার আব্দুল কাদের সাফেলি সহ আরো অনেকে তো আমি বিশেষভাবে জানি না যিনি ইউকে থেকে আছেন রিচার্ড কেরিজ কোয়ার্ডিনেটর অফ রিসার্চ অ্যান্ড গ্র্যাজুয়েট স্টাডিজ ইন দ্য হিউম্যানিটিস বাটস পা ইউনিভার্সিটি ইউকে ডক্টর সুকল্যাণ চক্রবর্তী অ্যাসোসিয়েট প্রফেসর ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ সিভিল অ্যান্ড এনভায়রনমেন্টাল ইঞ্জিনিয়ারিং বিড়লা ইনস্টিটিউট অফ টেকনোলজি ঝাড়খণ্ড এবং একজন বিশিষ্ট মানুষ উমাশঙ্কর মন্ডল যিনি ম্যানগ্রোভ ম্যান নামে পরিচিত এবং আজকের এই 
কোচবিহার কলেজ ওমেন্স সেল সিওপি এনএসএস টু এবং বসুন্ধরা ইকো ক্লাব এবং এনএসএস ইউনিট অফ বেলদা কলেজ তাদের যে সুচিন্তিত চিন্তা ভাবনা যে বিষয় নির্বাচিত হয়েছে রিস্টোরেশন অফ ইকোলজি এনভায়রনমেন্ট বেনিফিটস অ্যান্ড সাস্টেনেবিলিটি এখান থেকে আমরা সকলেই নানাভাবে উপকৃত হব এবং আমাদের এই ওয়েবিনিয়ার সম্পূর্ণ সাফল্য লাভ করবে এই আশা রাখছি এবং সকলকে আবার আন্তরিক ধন্যবাদ কৃতজ্ঞতা অভিনন্দন জানিয়ে কোচবিহার কলেজের আইপিএসি তরফ থেকে স্বাগতম জানিয়ে আমার বক্তব্য শেষ করছি ধন্যবাদ বড়দের প্রণাম ছোটদের স্নেহ ভালোবাসা অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ আমাদের আইকিউসি কোয়ার্ডিনেটর ডক্টর মৃদুল ঘোষকে উই আর ভেরি থ্যাঙ্কফুল টু ইম বিকজ হি ইজ অলসো বিজি টুডে বিকজ আই এম অলরেডি স্টেটেড দ্যাট এক্সামিনেশন ইজ গোইং অন থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ফর ইয়োর ভ্যালুয়েবল স্পিচ উই আর এগেন থ্যাঙ্কফুল অন বিহাফ অফ কোচবিহার কলেজ অ্যান্ড বেলদা কলেজ নাও আই উইল মুভ অন টু আওয়ার ফার্স্ট টেকনিক্যাল সেশন অ্যান্ড আওয়ার উই আর ওয়েটিং টু লিসেন রিচার্ড কেরেজ Uh, the coordinator of research and graduate studies in the humanities bath spa university uk and before i welcome uh, him i would uh, uh, like to read out his bio and uh, before uh, that uh, he is the personality of multi dimensional personality and sir um, uh, without um, uh, taking too much time he readily accepted our invitation on behalf of belda college and also coach bihar college we are really thankful to you sir and richard carriage is a nature writer and eco speaker cold blood adventures with reptiles and amphibians published by chatto and windows in uh, 2040 is a mixture of memoir and nature writing described by the sunday times as a minor classic it was adapted for bbc national radio and broadcast as a radio 4 book of the week other uh, nature writing by richard has been broadcast on bbc radio 4 and published in bbc wildlife poetry review and grantha and he was awarded the 2012 roger denkin prize by the society of author has twice received the bbc wildlife award for nature writing his most recent publication is a new annotated edition of j s prens plays based on a poem sequence the oval window edited using previously unavailable archive memorial material in collaboration with the late n h revi and published by blonze in 2018 at batspa university richard leads the ma in creative writing and coordinate research and post graduate studies in uh, in english literature and creative writing a leading eco critic he has published essays on eco critical topics ranging from shakespeare thomas hardy to present day fiction poetry nature writing and the film and he was founding chair of ASLE UKI and has been an elected member of the ASLE executive council and was founding chair of ASLE UKI with Craig Gerard he is co-editor of the Bloomsbury academic series entitled environmental culture the first series of monographs in the environmental humanities to be published in britain so by invitation he has recently joined the steering committee of new networks for nature an organization that brings together artists writers academics from the science and humanities broadcaster and conservationalist ngos politicians from across the spectrum and policy maker with the common aim of defending and celebrating the natural world and now i would like to welcome richard keris you have uh, so many uh, world of experience with you and uh, we are waiting to listen over to richard keris can you hear me everybody yes yes yes, yes sir I... you are audible 
thank you. I am honoured to be here and delighted to accept this invitation. So thank you, all of you. I am going to try to share my presentation. Um, so I'm just going to try and put my PowerPoint onto the screen so that you can see it, um, which would be there. Can, can you see it now? No, sir. Ah, right. So that, yes, I'm not sure how to do that. I thought that would work. Um, hold on. Uh, yes. I'm sorry, that doesn't seem to work. Uh, Shubit sir, can you help uh, Richard sir? To sir, there is an upward you... arrow sign beside the hand sign. Yes, I, I was trying that. Okay. So, but when I click on share, it doesn't work. Um, possibly the best thing for me to do is I can read the talk anyway. And shall, can I send you the PowerPoint as a, an attachment? I'm sorry, this, I don't know why this hasn't uh, worked. Sir, is it, would it be possible to uh, email it so that I can share it from my computer? Hang, hang on, can you see it now? No, sir, it's not visible yet. Right. Okay. Yes, sir, now it's visible. It's absolutely now it's visible. visible. Yeah. Yes. Now it's visible. Yes. Excellent, that's Thank great. You. And you can still hear me? Yes, sir, absolutely. Excellent, okay. So, in this lecture, I will draw upon my three different areas of academic expertise and attempt to bring them together, or at least explore the challenges they make to each other. Firstly... Sir, please, sir, please press a pipe. Uh, sorry? F5, F5 function key. Um, F5. F5. Yeah. That's it. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. It's not working. Okay. You continue. Can you see my you? screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And you can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, Excellent. Sir. Good. Okay. So, I am a creative writer. My genre is nature writing, which combines literary description of the natural world with scientific natural history and ecology, philosophical argument, cultural analysis, and personal memoir. My book, Cold Blood, is a lyrical and some of these traditions. If so, the hope is that the genre can foster a popular love of wild nature that is ecologically informed, responsive to environmental threats, diverse in its points of view, and interested in dialogue between different perspectives. Two, I am also an eco-critic. That is to say, a literary and cultural critic who wants to evaluate texts and other cultural forms on the basis of whether they are helpful or harmful to our collective effort to avert environmental crisis. Do they perpetuate attitudes that might once have been valid, but that now have to change, such as the representation of wild nature as a relatively unchanging set of conditions? in contrast to the dramatic changes of fortune faced by human individuals or groups? Can the traditional literary and artistic forms be used to represent our current crisis, or do we need new forms and genres? Eco-criticism is often perceived, like other cultural and political movements, as having transformed itself in a series of waves. 
This metaphor is not entirely satisfactory since it suggests that each new wave has displaced the last in simple succession. What in fact happens is that new waves arrive and become central and powerful, but the earlier waves do not disappear. They are not exhausted or obliterated. In eco-criticism, the first and second waves are still advancing, even though the third has arrived. And there are many small subcurrents that may grow into new waves or persist as smaller forces. So, what were eco criticism's waves? The first wave. Among the first scholars to call themselves eco critics in the early 1990s, there was frequently a determination to counteract what they saw as the excessive abstraction and cultural constructionism of the post-structuralist theory that was then so dominant in literary and cultural studies. This view is well represented in the Eco-Criticism Reader, edited by Cheryl Glockfelty and Harold Fromm in 1996. These critics believed that the emphasis on cultural construction, which usually meant sceptical deconstruction, had led to a dangerous neglect of the study of physical reality. Their answer, exemplified by Jonathan Bates' insistence in Romantic Ecology, 1991, that the owls in a poem by William Wordsworth must be taken seriously as real owls and that metaphorical meanings should not displace their reality, was to return to a realist and at least partly literalist account of linguistic representation. With this went a determination to revise the literary canon by including and taking seriously the nature writing genre, previously seen as naively literalist or escapist. The second wave. A further and much wider extension to the literary and cultural canon was demanded in the late 1990s and early 2000s by what in the USA is called the environmental justice movement. These were eco-critics concerned to reveal the connections between environmental problems and the forms of social injustice inflicted on women, people of color and working class people or rural poor people or indigenous people who were victims of colonialism. The project of this second wave was to pay intersectional attention to the ways in which different victimized groups were disproportionately exposed to environmental hazards. Second wave eco-criticism explores the relationships between environmental priorities and those of feminism, anti-racism, queer theory, post-colonialism, and the continuing struggle for decolonization. From these perspectives, nature writing and other traditions of the love of wild nature would be interrogated as to whether they were exclusively white, masculine, or Western. This statement by the eco-critic Lawrence Buell describes the shift. Early eco-criticism's enthusiasm for restoring contact between modern humans and the natural world has to a large extent given way to indictment of preservationism as an imposition of the privileged, white, affluent, Eurocentric and of the conception of the natural world itself, qua space apart, as a specious artifact of cultural nostalgia. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sir, That's your slide slide is stuck in slide number two. It has not proceeded, actually. Oh. You can see only slide number two. Oh, um, right. So that's slide number two. Um, can you see? Can you see it now? No, sir, not yet. Um, let me, let me do, 
Uh, what can you see now? Uh, sir, we can still see slide number two, the first slide. Right. I'm sorry, I don't know. Click on the see. respective slide, sir. Sorry? Just click on the respective slide, uh, which one you want to show. I'm now clicking on this one. This is now, I think, slide number four. And I'm carrying on. Okay. Uh, like it's still not yet visible, the slide number four. Is that, can you see it now? Uh, no, sir, not yet. So it's still the same one? Yes, sir, it's still slide number two. I'm very sorry, I don't know how to do that. Sir, uh, sir you can restart it. Uh, please close the window and can you can restart it, then it may work, sir. Okay. Right. Uh. Okay, so now I'm stop presenting. Now I'm okay. Can you see it now? Not yet, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay. Uh, so if I are... go to F five, it will get bigger. Yes, sir. It will be get, it will get in the full screen mode, and yeah. then, but so we can still see slide number two. Yes, sir. Now we can see the fourth slide, first wave. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. So the one I want now. This is the one I'm on. Okay, the sixth slide. Yes, sir. Okay. Shall I? Can I leave it at that size? Yes, sir. No issue. Is that is, okay? That, yes, I think, sir. It, I think it went wrong when I went full screen. Okay. Okay. okay, okay. okay. Were you able to hear what I was saying? Was I too fast? No, no, sir. It was audible. Only we could not see the slides. Excellent. Okay. I'm sorry about that. So, other influential examples include Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence, um, the environmental and social violence that is inflicted on faraway countries by Western habits and structures of consumption, but is stubbornly invisible to those consumers. And Val Plumwood's concept of shadow places, the invisible haunting partner places of rich Western localities. These shadow places are the ones where apparently innocent consumerism in the industrial world does damage that the consumers cannot see. Eco-criticism has another important job here to point to the invisibility in the West of this slow violence that results from a myriad small acts of consumerism. And to imagine and encourage forms of representation that would make these connections visible. And then the third wave is post-humanist, new materialist, and Anthropocene eco-criticism. Its intellectual project is a redescription of the world that dissolves the singular figure of the human subject, distinguished by unique properties such as soul, reason, mind, free will, or intentionality, into the dense web of material relations in which all things are enmeshed. That is the definition given by the eco-critic Hannes Bergthaler. Third wave eco-criticism seeks to change the pervasive emphasis in Western culture upon the distinctness and autonomy of the individual self. Selfhood is not denied but its embeddedness in material networks and systems by which it is constituted and maintained is given greater emphasis. In a curious way, this move 
brings eco-criticism back into compatibility with post-structuralism, with its emphasis on continuous construction and discursiveness. But the eco-critical version is material as well as cultural, and the two forms of construction are inseparable. So what is advocated in this third wave is a shift of emphasis in the way we imagine the self. From the self as an atomized individual with hard boundaries to a self always already in the process of producing the world and being produced by it. That is a self through which the world flows. A self that is as conceptually inseparable as it is materially inseparable from the larger ecosystem that sustains its physical body. Ecological perception dissolves unifying notions of selfhood and strong dualistic separations between culture and nature, subject and object, or human and non-human. Instead of those rigid binary separations, we have shared ancestry, co-evolution, system, process, energy flow, hybridity, actor networks, post-humanism, symbiosis, biosemiotics, and the continuous mutual constitution of self and world. This is the system of relationships that the eco-critic Timothy Morton calls the mesh. Stacey Alamo calls it transcorporeality. And other new materialist theorists call it distributed agency. For Morton, this idea, the ecological thought, as he calls it, is an opportunity to reconcile eco-criticism with post-structuralist theory by discovering that in the material world, as well as the cultural, there is nothing that is pre-discursive or non-discursive. I now come back to my third academic practice. I am a teacher of creative writing, as well as literary criticism. We mainly teach using the workshop method. The workshop groups consist of not more than eight students. Each week, four students circulate work by email in advance of the class. These pieces of creative writing are not more than 10 pages of prose or poetry. Everyone reads them and comes to the class with notes and prepared comments. Students are asked to identify the strengths of the writing and the areas that need improvement and to make some comments about local matters, such as particular words, sentences and paragraphs, and some comments about the forward reaching strategies of the work, if it is an excerpt from a whole book in progress, or about the overall decisions the author has made if it is a single complete piece, such as a short story or poem. Sometimes we go around the room giving comments in turn and sometimes have a more spontaneous discussion in which students join as the points occur to them. Either way, the usual convention is that the author of the piece remains silent during this phase and listens without debating the points made. After this phase, the author has the opportunity to comment on what has been said and then the tutor gives their own thorough response to the piece followed by one more phase of open discussion. That's the creative writing workshop method as we use it, as it is commonly used across creative writing discipline. So my question for today is how can I bring these three practices together? How can I write my nature writing in a way that is responsive to the aims and concerns of all three waves of eco-criticism? And how can my teaching, my workshopping of novels, stories, poems and non-fiction written by students be similarly responsive? 
The influence, of course, should not go entirely one way. It is also important to ask how the critical practice, the eco-criticism in all three varieties, can be changed by the lessons learned in creative practice. New materialism has an unfortunate paradox. Its emphasis is on materiality and process. All life, all action is embodied, embedded in ecological relations, processes of constant semiotic and evolutionary exchange. It is always already discursive, always already engaged in a network of what the physicist and eco-critic Karen Barad calls intra-action. This term is an alternative to interaction, which implies relations between two already formed entities, rather than the ceaseless mutual constitution of all entities that she wishes to describe. There is no position outside or prior to this embeddedness. This is what eco-criticism has taken from post-structuralism and Heidegger. Yet the paradox is that this idea exists primarily at present in the form of abstract theory. How can it become a creative practice, a literary form or style? This is a question for the new nature writing. The startling resurgence of the nature writing genre that has occurred in the UK over the last decade or so. And there quickly are some of the books that represent this resurgence of nature writing, including my own in the top right-hand corner there, Cold Blood, the new nature writing. So title after title in this genre has appeared recently. One of the most famous uh, is H's for Hawk, Helen MacDonald's combination of nature writing and bereavement memoir. And this and others have achieved mass readership. A literary agent said to me recently that he thought publishers at the moment were looking for two kinds of writing, psychological thrillers and nature writing. Certainly this development is a source of hope for environmentalists and eco-critics. Why has it happened? Why has the genre suddenly emerged so strongly? Could it be connected with growing public unease about climate change and biodiversity loss? If so, we could be seeing a sign of a major cultural shift with the potential to become a political shift also, though it feels risky to extrapolate too much from a literary development. But how new is this new nature writing? What would it have to do to be new in ways eco-critics would find valuable? Perhaps it is easiest to define these qualities by looking at the tendencies of the old nature writing that eco-critics find problematical, the tendencies that the new writing should try to recognise and change. So the old nature writing, what did it do? Here are some points. It expressed a defensive anti-urban and anti-cosmopolitan and thus anti-ecological desire for solitude in nature. It rejected mass democratic industrial modernity and sought enclaves that offered escape from the modern city or modern culture. It featured protagonists who turned away from social life and sought epiphanies in solitary encounters with wild nature, though there was always a paradoxical quality to that desire when it was disseminated in popular literature. And the old nature writing frequently found itself in a conservative stance, because industrial development threatens wildlife and most wild species are much less abundant than in the pre-industrial past. The genre thus became associated with searches for a mythical past. So these are the challenges that I put to nature writers, including novelists and poets in the writing workshops along with the aims of the three eco-critical waves that I've talked about. And there is one more challenge to add. The eco-critic Timothy Clark, in his Cambridge Introduction to Literature and the Environment, and his later book, Eco-Criticism at the Edge, 
sees what he calls derangements of scale as the central difficulty posed by climate change and by other ecological problems. For Clark, a powerful reason why we find these problems so difficult to act upon and why literature and the other arts find them so difficult to represent is that they play havoc with our accustomed sense of scale. Our perception especially of which actions and events are important and which are trivial. According to Clark, climate change has brought us a new world stranger than even most eco-critics have realised. Disconcerting adjustments must be made to our recognition of which actions and topics are important and which are trivial. Environmental slogans urge us eat less meat and help save the planet. Or they follow horrifying predictions of climate chaos with injunctions no less solemn not to leave electrical appliances on standby or overfill the kettle. Such language would have seemed surreal or absurd to an earlier generation and enacts a bizarre derangement of scales, collapsing the trivial and the catastrophic into each other. So startling transformations of literary orientation and form are required. Can we imagine stories concerned not only with characters falling in love or facing immediate physical danger, but also with how those characters learned to change in response to ecological crisis. Is it imaginable? A novel in which a character's failure to switch off the lights was treated as a momentous, tragic error and used as a dramatic plot point, like falling in love or murder in conventional fiction. The particular character's failure would have to represent the general failure of consumer society. That character would have somehow to be given epic status. Or do we need to move further away from conventional stories and characters? For Clark, character is part of the problem, since conventional fictional character makes the personal lifespan into the main time frame of the fiction. Implicitly or explicitly, the usual suggestion is that the dramatic intensity of a novel's plot derives from the reader's perception that its plot points, its most intense moments of action, are the decisive events of the characters' lives, the ones that most determine the emotional tone of the remainder of those lives after the plot's conclusion. They lived happily ever after. But ecological problems often need to be projected onto longer periods of time than the individual lifespan. Climate change gives us the clearest example of this need. To perceive climate change, we need to look back into deep history, using a variety of sources of evidence, and forward into at least the next hundred years, using a variety of ways of making projections. As a result of scale effects, says Clark, what is self-evident or rational at one scale may well be destructive or unjust at another. Hence, progressive arguments designed to affirm individual rights and help disseminate Western levels of prosperity may even resemble on another scale an insane plan to destroy the biosphere. Yet, for, say, any individual household or motorist, a scale effect in their actions is invisible. It is not present in any phenomenon in itself, but only in the contingency of how many other such phenomena there are, have been and will be, at even large distances in space or time. Can the leviathan of humanity en masse as a geological force be represented? No, says Clark at least not in the realist mode, still dominant in the novel. Its effects are global and non-localizable. So, similar difficulties are raised by the long distance nature of many of the ecological relationships implicated in the environmental crisis. And also by the relationship Clark mentions between very small 
conventionally trivial actions and immense consequences. A relationship that obscures the scale on which moral consciousness and narrative normally operate. Climate change manifests itself in ways that are too small and yet too large, too close and yet too distant. The middle distance is missing. Lyric poetry that uses an I persona also has difficulty with these perspectives, having to bring them within the frame of a dramatised personal consciousness. So I'll, I'll skip a little bit here because um, I think I'm taking too much time. So, but, but, but what I'm talking about here is the challenge that ecological crisis, you know, various ecological topics, including climate change, presents to our traditional modes of literary representation, especially realistic modes. Um, and by extension, this is a challenge to that notion of selfhood, which is dominated by hard borders between self and other. And what are the literary solutions that can enable us to begin to represent these problems in writing? And there would be similar suggestions in relation to the visual arts or dramatic performance. I'm going to offer a couple of examples, uh, one British and one Indian. So the first of these examples of an innovation in literary form in response to these problems is a book pictured here um, by the poet Jean Sprackland, a book called Strands, which is about some regular walks that she took on Ainsdale Beach, uh, a seaside beach near Liverpool. As a setting, the beach immediately brings together contrasting scales of experience, since it is at once a sublime threshold, an edge from which the infinite may be confronted, and a comforting and familiar space of leisure. Each chapter is built around a particular object encountered on one of her walks. A deep sea creature, for example, washed up at her feet, an industrial relic, a wild animal, or in one chapter, a mass of discarded plastic objects, all the plastic litter that she finds on the beach. She makes a list of these items of litter. Petrol can, one. Drinks carton, two. Sanitary towel wrapper, 13. Sweet wrapper, 39. Chocolate bar wrapper, 49. Toy dinosaur, one. Rope, two. Chris packet, four. Bart Simpson stencil, one. Ice lolly wrapper, seven. And that's only a little bit of a much longer list. And she makes this comment. Can we even imagine a world without plastic. What was life like before it so thoroughly colonised our homes, offices, vehicles, streets, shops, gardens and parks? Its success story has been so phenomenal that it's hard to say what we would be without it. But our grandparents would know. We've only been mass producing plastic since the 1930s. There was a time within living memory when plastic was a rare sight and a novelty. So there we see several of Clark's derangements of scale. There is the fact that the mass production of plastic goods began within living memory. Set against geological time or deep time, that is a minute period, scarcely the blink of an eye. But in that time, the plastic has filled up the world, becoming one of the main pieces of evidence that human activity is now a geological forcing agent, which is the basis of the concept of the Anthropocene. Spatially, the chapter moves from the immediate setting and unthreatening scale of the beach 
contained by an afternoon walk out to the immensity of the great Pacific garbage patch, this continent-sized agglomeration of plastic litter floating on the ocean surface uh, uh, assembled there by the tides. As with the washed up deep sea creatures she finds on the beach, there is a curious inversion in which the deepest and most inaccessible places become thoroughly known and domesticated or even banal, while the nearby familiar places become mysterious and vast in their connections. One is reminded of that famous picture that circulated a few years ago of a tin of spam found at the bottom of the deepest trench in the Pacific, the Mariana Trench. There it is. This common household object, this tin of processed meat, lying there at the very deepest bottom of the ocean. Have we turned the ocean space familiar or our own space strange or both? In Sprackland's list, the ordinary domestic objects, especially the children's toys, have an innocence about them. They're too trivial to matter, but they are destroying the world. A similar effect occurs when she comes across human and animal footprints exposed as the retreating tide has peeled off a layer of mud. They are prints from the late Mesolithic period, roughly the year 7000 BC, when Neolithic culture was first emerging in Europe. When the tide comes in, they will be washed away, preserved in darkness for thousands of years. In the light, they last only hours. Perhaps, however, a more problematical scale contradiction is in the way that however vast the spaces and time periods each chapter opens, all are contained in that short leisure activity, the afternoon walk. At the end, she goes home or goes back to work and the huge scale she has opened close once again. They're contained in that space. So. That's one example of a form of nonfiction writing, uh, memoir, nature writing, that engages with these problems of scale. To conclude, I'm going to look at another and with humility, I hope, turn to a solution to these dilemmas offered by Indian eco-criticism and an Indian novel. One of the most important tasks for the decolonizing movement in eco-criticism and nature writing is to move beyond the conception of indigenous culture and transnational industrial modernity as incompatible opposites, that binary division between them. Their dialectic can be much more complex than that, as revealed by the post-colonialist eco-critic Upamanyu Pablo Mukherjee in his book, Postcolonial Environments, a book I very much recommend. Mukherjee follows the postcolonial theorist Rob Nixon and Val Plumwood in setting out a postcolonial critique of first wave eco criticism, especially the wilderness focused North American version. The critique is mainly directed at the notions of purity and stability that allegedly, at least, are essential to this eco criticism the search for pure wilderness untouched by human presence. Mukherjee notes that these environmentalist themes have sometimes been exploited by campaigners against immigrants and refugees, and that the conservation of wildlife has often been pursued at the expense of people living in the same places. And... so. His argument is that an alternative account of development and modernization is needed. One that rejects the proposition that a simple choice has to be made between traditional non-industrial cultures and Western style industrial development, structured and commodified by globalized capital. Colonialism was brutally destructive of traditional cultures of intimate understanding of local ecosystems. When these cultures stood in the way of industrial exploitation, their resistance was crushed. Colonial ideology positioned them with nature 
as obstructions to be overcome and resources to be exploited. It imposed upon them various forms of subaltern hybridity, and many of these structures of power, exploitation and hierarchy remained when the empires ended. They dominated the immediate post-colonial landscape and in some cases continue to adapt and develop now. The question for post-colonial decolonizing eco-critics is how to resist the destructive polarities frequently used to define post-colonial industrial development, polarities that derive from colonial culture. There is a parallel here with the concerns of eco-feminism, how to reject an, ideo an ideological identification of the oppressed people with nature but not in the process recoil from the whole idea of sympathetic closeness to nature. For post-colonialist eco-critics, the question is how traditional cultures can survive in modernity, enjoy its benefits and inform it rather than be swept aside by industrial capitalist development. Um, the writer Aaron Dutty Roy has presented a startling juxtaposition in Broken Republic, her book about the struggle of forest tribal people in central India to protect their land against the government and the mining companies. She puts together two perceptions of mountains in Orissa. Quite often, if the mining company is a known and recognised one, the chances are that even though the ore is still in the mountain, it will already have been traded on the futures market. So while for the Advasis, the mountain is still a living deity, the fountainhead of life and faith, the keystone also from a scientific point of view of the ecological health of the region, for the corporation is just a cheap storage facility. So there are three different ways of seeing here traditional religious ecological environmentalist traditional religious ecological environmentalist and industrial capitalist roy's technique here used for brutal starkness since the third view is so utterly exclusive of the others is to place them side by side in a way that demands that we consider their possible relations with each other and what we think are the due claims of each and i'll explore this further with a quick reading of one of the most famous contemporary Indian novels, Amitav Ghosh's novel about the Sundarbans, The Hungry Tide. There it is, and this is Pablo Mukherjee's book, which I've been talking about. So a place-centered literary text that develops these dialectics so as to apply specific tests to environmentalism is Amitav Ghosh's novel, The Hungry Tide, published in 2004. It has become a much cited text in post-colonial eco-criticism. I here offer an eco-critical reading of the novel to exemplify the combination of elements with which post-colonial eco ecological writing must engage. And as, of course, here, people here know very well, the Sundarbans is a very distinctive ecosystem whose features readily yield up a strong poetic language that permeates or saturates the novel, providing many extensive metaphors. The novel contains much lyrical nature writing, always embedded in plot and point of view. In the opening chapter, Two cosmopolitan characters are on their way to the Sundarbans and meet on a train. One, a man, is Kanai, a successful university-educated translator with a successful business in Kolkata. The other, a woman, is Pia, Indian by birth but a naturalised American, an ecologist, specifically a cetologist, who has come to survey the Sundarbans for the presence of endangered estuarine and river dolphins. Kanai is going there at the summons of his aunt, Nilima, who works heroically running a health mission in the heart of the tide country. 
She wants him to read some papers left for Kanai's eyes only by his deceased uncle, her husband, Nirmal. These papers have recently come to light. Nirmal died in the early 1970s, having been found in a traumatised state after a mysterious disappearance. Thus, the novel establishes a very recognisable plot device and hook line, the mysterious papers. Another is provided by the erotic interest in Pia that Kanai feels as soon as he sees her. Perhaps she begins to develop a similar interest in him. They go their separate ways and the story intercuts between them. Kanai opening the packet of papers and Pia setting out on her scientific expedition. She soon falls into the hands of corrupt forest rangers and escapes when their boat stops to extort money from a local crab fisherman, Fokir. Pia falls into the water while struggling to throw Fokir a bundle of her own money in compensation. He rescues her and carries her away on his own boat, leading her, after she explains her quest, to a place where the rare dolphins regularly congregate. Fokir knows of this because of the traditional myths taught him by his mother, Kusum, who died, as it turns out, in the incident that tra traumatised Nirmal. The story gives us extensive accounts of these myths, stories of the goddess of the Sundarbans, Bombibi, and her eternal adversary, the tiger demon, Dokin Rai. These stories are related in songs, a festival performance, and finally an extensive translation made by Kanai for Pia. Pablo Mukherjee identifies the performance as belonging to the Jatra tradition of Bengali folk theatre, which itself has been adept at incorporating new styles and technologies and is capable of using these for the expression of traditional animist beliefs about the natural environment. Here in the novel, the performance seems to play a role in reconciling the audience, the local people, to a natural home in which they are constantly in danger from being preyed upon by tigers. M Mukherjee's account of the purpose of the diversity of viewpoints and cultural forms in the novel is that like An Arundhati Roy, Gosh is concerned with imagining commonalities and ways of belonging in the ravaged post-colonial environments while at the same time acknowledging the considerable forces invested against these redemptive possibilities. Like Roy, Gosh asks, how can the story of the post-colonial ruling elite's complicity in the devastation of their subjects and their environment be told in an elitist language and cultural form, the post-colonial English novel? The answer from both writers is that they must transform the novel itself by incorporating into it elements of the local vernacular cultural forms. In The Hungry Tide, the encounter with these forms is part of an education undergone by the elite cosmopolitan characters. As Mukherjee says, all the elites in the novel, Nirmal, Kanai and Pia, encounter a series of heterogeneous cultural texts, songs, folk tales, oral histories, and most crucially, the Jatra, which provide them with challenging counter narratives that disturb their normative understandings of knowledge, civility and progress. The, this mythic material intertwines with the scientific understanding and conservationist environmentalism of Pia, the literary cosmopolitanism and entrepreneurialism of Kanai, the disillusioned Marxism of Nirmal, and the scientific humanism of Nilima. Comparably to the Jatra, perhaps, the novel also incorporates with these elements that challenge the Western or cosmopolitan reader some familiar devices from Western popular fiction, dramatic escapes, hurried explanatory conversations, portentous chapter endings. The eco-critical hope, and this is my final point, the eco-critical hope that the novel expresses is that alliances between all these positions may be established. 
Pierre finds the dolphins with a combination of Fokir's mythic information and her own scientific resources, as represented by the global positioning system she carries with her at all times, which sends a signal to a satellite so that its message back will inform her of her exact position in the mazy waterways and log it for her. Nevertheless, conflicts arise between ecological conservation and the interests and desires of the local people. Nirmal's papers tell the story of a community of refugees who settled on one of the islands and were evicted by the regional government on the grounds that the island was to be part of a wildlife sanctuary. Refusing to leave, the refugees were bloodily attacked. Many were killed. Women are said to have been kidnapped and raped. This is the novel's traumatic kernel. Basing its fictionalisation on several historical incidents, but principally the notorious Marichepi massacre of 1979, the novel dramatises ways in which environmental arguments can provide cover for other political purposes, including brutal ones. The more routine conflict between conservation interests and those of the indigenous people is debated explicitly and passionately by Kanai and Pia, with the undercurrent of angry sexual feeling running strongly between them after they have witnessed a tiger being trapped in a hut and speared to death by villagers. In the novel's denouement, a great storm sweeps over the islands, bringing the novel to a climax. Fokir saves Pia using his dweller's knowledge but sacrifices himself. With his death, the novel enables itself to reflect a cruel social reality while freeing the plot of Pia's dilemma. She has lost all her data in the storm, but the global positioning system, her one surviving piece of equipment, holds a record of all her movements with Fokia. This will enable her to continue the study as his memorial. Using grants collected on the strength of the tragic story, the work will be done in collaboration with Nilima's Health Education Trust, thus benefiting the local people and resolving the conflict between conservation and the economic needs of those people on which the novel has repeatedly touched. So that is a win-win for everybody except the sacrificial victims, Kusum Nirmal and Fokir. The Hungry Tide finally offers a hopeful model of a decolonized environmentalism. Though the hope is qualified and there is a strong sense of the tragedies that happen on the way. And perhaps also there is a faintly ironical mimicry of the conventional resolutions of 19th century European realist novels. There may be strong reasons for post-colonial critics to be wary of environmental initiatives from the metropolitan centres. But as Rob Nixon points out, the notion that environmental politics are a luxury politics for the world's wealthy is clearly untenable. Like other post-colonial environmentalists and eco-critics, Nixon points to non-Western environmental movements grounded in local communities and typically alert to the interdependence of human survival and environmental change in situations where the illusion of static purity cannot be sustained, far less exalted as an ideal. This is the novel's position. Pia, at the end, is a humbled metropolitan scientist seeking to work with such a movement in Fokir's memory. And this, more generally, is the aspiration also of a decolonized eco-criticism and nature writing of which I hope to see much more, especially from Indian writers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, respected Richard Kerridge. Uh, for your wonderful and enlightful uh, thought and that uh, you provoke so many things but uh, it's difficult uh, to cope up with this time because time is running out sir and uh, thank you on behalf of Belda College and Coach Bihar College for your precious time sir and you have touched all the points you have touched Sundarbon, Amitabh Ghosh, Pablo Mukherjee and all those things actually uh, you relate uh, UK with um, our India 
in uh, not only on ecological ground but on writing also and on because our uh, today's program is also uh, before our independence day so it's a uh, unity in diversity we have different diverse culture and we have diverse ecosystem also so thank you uh, thank you sir for giving us this time and uh, your thoughts and thank, thank you thank you for inviting me and i am sorry if i took a little bit too long but no, but, sir, but okay but thank you uh, may i stay to listen to some of the others right sir well, yes, yes you can sir thank it's you thank you very sir. much i'd like to do that please be with us sir uh, now i uh, i would like to welcome before uh, dr shukolan chakraborty associate professor department of civil and environmental engineering billa institute of uh, technology jharkhand west bengal uh, we are waiting for him also uh, before that i would like to uh, welcome professor uh, sritoma uh, ma'am uh, to introduce our uh, speaker dr uh, shukolan chakraborty yeah am i audible yes yes ma'am you are audible okay thank you uh, dr shukanta ghosh for giving me the opportunity to introduce dr shukolan chakraborty at the very outset i would like to congratulate professor richard for his wonderful session thank you sir thank you so much so uh, and at the, again i would like to welcome dr shukolan chakraborty uh, chakraborty to this event let me now uh, take this opportunity to introduce dr chakraborty Dr Shukolan Chakraborty is presently working as an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Birla Institute of Technology Misra and has earned his doctorate degree in environmental science. He had postdoctoral research experience as an endeavor fellow at the University of South Australia and National Chengkang University Taiwan with top 100 university advancement fellowship. He has expertise in the field of arsenic biogeochemistry, environmental pollution monitoring, and assessment and remediation of emerging contaminants with the help of nanotechnology. He has successfully guided five PhD students and fourteen MTech students till now, and have also completed two research projects funded by the Department of Science and Technology and the University Grants Commission. He has received a Fulbright. specialist grant in 2019 till date he has published 48 research papers in international journals of repute he has 14 book chapters and four popular articles in his credit we welcome you dr chakraborty to this event and hoping to get wide range of inputs from your talk over to you dr shukolan chakraborty thank you uh, thank you madam a uh, very good morning to all and i consider myself blessed uh, because i could get the opportunity to listen to professor richard kerridge who is a stalwart in the field of environmental science ethics and associated uh, topics i express my thanks to the organizers of this conference and um, yes the organizers of i think there are two colleges they are collectively um, organizing this program i am uh, i'm thankful to all of you for uh, inviting me to give a talk uh, on the field on which i work today so thank you very much uh, i will start my presentation and uh, i have heard that mostly there will be students so most of the slides i have kept only pictures so i think it would be uh, uh, interesting for the students so let me start presenting here today i'll be talking on um, eco technological restoration of coal mining areas my institute is situated in jharkhand as uh, all of you might be knowing that jharkhand is very well known for its mining areas we have huge coal mining areas we have other uh, mines also and most importantly we have the jadugura uranium mines also so lot of mines are there in this state of our country and uh, till date there has been a uh, lot of mining activities without proper 
environmental um, closure plans or environmental reclamation and remediation after the mining is over. Today also, if you go to many parts of the mining areas of this state, you will find uh, the abundant mines are lying uh, like that only without any reclamation, without any uh, vegetation cover or anything. And uh, you also might be knowing about Jharia coal fire. Uh, it is one of the incident that has been occurring for the last hundred years in our state. Uh, recently, uh, we have also started working on that with a professor from USA, Professor Robert Finkelman. Uh, so we have started on working on Jharia coal fire and its associated impacts, health impacts on the local population. So realizing this, that when a mine is closed, you do not have anything more to extract out of that mine. You have to bring that mine back to its originality. So that's, you know, that is a concept which was, yeah, it was realized by our uh, ministry, our country and several countries of the world. But today also, if you see several places of the world, this is hardly um, uh, implemented. So here I will be talking about basically the means, the technological means and the ecological means by which we can bring back the originality of the mining areas. And I will be focusing my presentation uh, mainly towards coal mining areas. So let me present it. I hope I am audible enough. Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, the slides can be seen. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. It's okay. visible. Okay, thank you. Yes, so starting with coal mine, uh, the slides, okay. yeah. Starting with the coal mines, first of all, let me tell you that, you know, it's not that if you start digging the earth, you will find the coal. Coal exists in some specific layers, like what you can see in this picture. Uh, just let me check if I can put it on slideshow mode and still it remains visible. No. Uh, I'm trying. No. Yeah. Uh, is it visible, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. okay, so as you can see here, these are the seams, you know, the layers where coal is present. Okay, these are the seams. Now, if you start digging it from the top, first of all, this layer you have to remove, then only you will reach to the first seam of the coal and you can then extract out the coal. Similarly, again, then you have to continue digging till you reach to the next seam of the coal. So actually coal exists in seams like this. These are called coal seams. Okay. But the rest of the material, which is unwanted to me uh, from uh, economic point of view, this has to be removed. And that creates the environmental disaster. There are basically two types of mining. We see here one is open cast mining, another one is underground mining. So these are some of the pictures showing you open cast mining, in which what happens? You just remove the upper part of this uh, debris or burden. We call it burden here from economic point of view. We remove this burden, dump it somewhere else, and then we extract out the coal. So that's ripping apart the uh, ground from the surface and going to the seams to collect the coals. And like this, coal is collected. This is again some of the pictures which are showing underground coal mining. And uh, different types of instruments uh, are used, uh, like uh, dump, uh, dumpers, dump, drag line, uh, several types of instruments are used. This is underground mining. But if you see the total magnitude of under, 
underground mining has become too less in our country as well as the world scenario if you see whereas open cast mining has gained its importance so in most of the mining areas you will find open cast mining is happening so this is the process of mining now what happens due to this okay and after after mining is done it's the chp and transport chp is coal handling plant you know the coal which is just extracted out of the earth it uh, are they can be big chunks or uh, they can have adhered impurities so this needs to be removed and sized and made um, into a respectable uh, i mean uh, size and uh, shape so that it can be transported for various uses so these are some of the other components other than uh, mining which are there in the coal mines okay so now what happens to the nature due to this mining first of course the first step is felling of trees and clearing for mining the first thing that needs to be done whenever a lithological survey is done and it is found that that place is having uh, prospective coal mine coal seams present over there so the first thing done is clearing of trees so here starts the environmental degradation first and finally we have after the coal is taken out we have a land abundant land abundant coal mine uh, left to us like this so you can you can just see the contrast of the nearby hills which was totally green lush green in color and finally when it has been mined this is what we do to the earth we do to the environment these are again some of the pictures where coal mining activities are going on and um, coal is being removed the overburden is being removed the overburden is getting dumped somewhere and the coal is uh, going for supply these are the overburdens if you travel in this region odisha Uh, jharkhand bihar even in parts of west bengal you will find uh, several overburden dumps like this so all those unwanted materials they have been dug out dug out and they have been deposited dumped like this which gives to the formation of a overburden dump like this so the place where it has been dumped that place has also lost its productivity the place from where it was dug out that place has also lost its productivity and the main thing is that after this is complete it's very difficult to again bring back that dump and uh, fill up the spaces which has been mined out though technically it needs to be done but at very few places it is done uh, significantly and what happens due to that these are the pictures which you commonly see when you go to some coal mining areas land degradation due to open cast mining this is a picture of kuju uh, kuju is an area in jharkhand only chadhi and kuju near hazaribagh where uh, ramgar it's near ramgar uh, coal mine areas are there so you can find this magnitude of land degradation going on due to the coal mining activities another problem which has often been encountered in this uh, uh, overburden dumps of the coal mining areas is self combustion of exposed shell because you know uh, if you if you see the process of formation of coal shell is also formed there okay and what happens it contains lot of hydrocarbons in it so whenever these hydrocarbons come in contact with the atmosphere they start burning as i have already told you that we have 100 years problem of coal fire in jharia coal mines so this exposed shell burning can also be seen in many places so due to this what happens no vegetation no productivity no ecological succession can happen in these areas the river courts get disturbed like uh, due to the dumping of the materials near the banks of the rivers uh, the capacity of the river gets altered the course uh, it gets disturbed by the dumping not only that uh, sometimes due to underground mining or even due to uh, surface mining or open cast mining they go and puncture the water level i mean uh, the aquifer so what happens there gets established a direct contact between the aquifer and the flowing river nearby 
So that also leads to a disturbance of the uh, river course. So these are real file photographs you can see here, where um, in the coal mines, the overburdened dumps are being uh, deposited over here, dumped over here, and that is leading to the disturbance in the river course of the Amodar. So here I would like to like you to see uh, an aerial photograph of the area before mining and after mining. So the upper picture, this one shows before mining, it was a fertile land with a lot of agricultural activities going on there and with some patches of vegetation. And after mining, the same area when it was photographed, aerial photograph shows here that the entire terrain has been devastated with the mining activities. No agricultural uh, practice can be done over here anymore. Forest patches have shifted. And here in the center, you can find a dark spot that is actually, uh, uh, that's called a mine pit. Mine pit is a very deep area where water from the groundwater aquifers, I mean from the aquifers, as well as the rainwater accumulates there. Uh, this water, in some of the studies, it has been shown that this water can be utilized for aquaculture and such purposes. But, you know, the risk of utilizing this water is that whenever there is precipitation in this entire basin or basement, the water runoff which gets collected in this mine pit is dosed with several heavy metals. The heavy metal comes from the unconsolidated rock materials in this catchment area. So what happens, this water gets enriched with several heavy metals. And if we practice ag aquaculture over here, the fishes, they tend to accumulate those metals in their body. And finally, they lead to bioamplification and biomagnification of those metals in the upper trophic levels and finally the human beings. So that's a risk associated with utilizing these mine pits. So uh, I hope you can imagine what happens to an area when coal mining or any sort of mining uh, is there and how the environment of, this, of, that, of that particular place is seriously deteriorated. We can sum up the overall impacts on the environment, like there is land cover changes, land use changes, large abundant mine pits are formed. This is again a picture of mine pit. Unproductive overburdened dumps are produced. I've shown you. Uh, uh, soil pollution, I've told you it's due to the unconsolidation of the bedrocks, debris. River water pollution due to runoff, air pollution. Air pollution is the major uh, Pollution factor, you can say, in any mining area, air pollution, all the, uh, I mean, miners are very much um, obsessed with uh, treating this pollution first, then look into other pollution. So air pollution is a big problem in mining industries. Groundwater is affected and hydrological changes occur. So these are all the impacts which happen due to mining. So what do you say? We should not do mining. No, we cannot stop mining because mining serves the backbone of the economy of any country. We have to go for mining, but we should go for mining where sustainable mining is practiced. Now, what is the meaning of this sustainable mining? Many people uh, say this terminology sustainable mining is an oxymoron. Uh, you cannot have sustainable mining. But yeah, uh, research studies have shown that we can have sustainable mining. Uh, maybe we cannot lead to zero discharge, but we can definitely have sustainable mining. And we can bring back the abundant mining areas back to its originality, if not to uh, the perfect originality, at least near it. Now, how can we do it? Here I'm going to talk about Reclamation. You can say it's the journey from unproductive to productive. Two things are mainly done in this ecological restoration process. One is technical or engineering reclamation, and the other one is biological reclamation. 
we cannot directly go for technical or uh, sorry we cannot directly go for biological reclamation on a overburden uh, dump site or an abandoned area before we do some technical or engineering reclamations so first i need to go for technical or engineering reclamations followed by biological reclamations so that i finally have the eco restoration of that place what are the things that we do for this technical reclamation let us see site preparation including top soil management regrading and terracing of the area to control erosion drainage and erosion control measures these are the three things which are done for technical reclamation now once we are done with the technical reclamation then the overburden dumps are uh, in a position where we can go for biological reclamation vegetation cover development planning after care and maintenance of reclaimed site this comes under biological reclamation the first thing that we need to do for uh, <clears throat> um, managing the uh, overburden dumps and the mine pits or the hollow areas the uh, so submerged areas is top soil management now what happens in a particular place when you are digging out something and going and dumping it somewhere else just a minute i'll just show you once this one say this is my mining area okay my coal seam is present over here this this is my coal seam so what do i do this is my burden this 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 entire thing is my burden so i do, what do i do i start digging when i start digging i dig the top soil first okay i take the top soil to a certain area and dump it over there then i take the subsoil and the consequent layers subsequent layers and go and dump them on top of it so what happens finally i form a dump over here with the top soil just at the base of it do you know what happens due to that top soil is actually the fertile soil why this is fertile because this soil contains lot of microorganisms in it and these are basically aerobic microorganisms that means they require oxygen to live okay so what do we do when we put all these things on the top soil slowly slowly these aerobic microorganisms they stop getting any oxygen from the atmosphere and slowly what happens this becomes an aerobic zone due to creation of an aerobic zone all these microorganisms die so after the mining is over if we again plan to say bring it back say we want to bring it back so what do we do we bring this layer first this layer second and again we bring the top soil here but now the top soil is totally unproductive because all the microorganisms who are there are now dead so what happens now i cannot go for biological reclamation i cannot plant trees over there the fertility of the soil is lost the soil has become totally unproductive i hope you can follow me because i cannot see yes yes sir okay. okay we are following okay so this is a real file photograph of top soil uh, stored separately for subsequent so yeah so what do we need to do so we need to keep the top soil somewhere else and the rest of the burden at other place so that when we go for backfilling this thing is called backfilling so when we go for backfilling we can bring this top soil at last from a zone where the aerobic content of that i mean oxygen content of that soil had been maintained i can bring that and just dump it there this is how we do the spreading of the top soil see these are the below layers and on top of that i'm spreading the top soil because the top soil contains the microorganisms top soil contains the fertility okay here uh, another thing needs to be remembered uh, that is dump configuration you know uh, when i'm bringing back it or even when i'm uh, creating the overburden dumps 
I should follow some um, angle of inclination. Okay, like slope angle should be less than twenty eight degrees, and back slope. Uh, what is this back slope? You know, when erosion will happen from here, everything will come down, and if this one is flat, what will happen? It will flow and again go to the lower layers. So that's why we create a back slope over here. Due to the creation of back slope of three degrees, what happens? The debris gets settled over here. Only the water goes to the uh, uh, lower lying region of the overburdened dumps. So this is very important when we go for dump configuration uh, of the overburdened dumps as well as for backfilling. See here you can see uh, how uh, the materials are being dumped, and on top of that, the topsoil is being spread like this. These are producing the contour trenches. Contour trenches are provided to uh, check the soil erosion. So this is at the end of technical reclamation. MCL mines of CIL, Coal India Limited, uh, ka ye, uh, original photograph. Hai. This is technical reclamation. So once the technical reclamation is done, here you can see this was the first the overburden dump. The overburden dump was stabilized, then the topsoil was spread, and now it is finally ready for bioengineering. But before bioengineering, we need some other measures also. Just uh, uh, as, as we have seen over here, in the overburden dump, several subsidized areas are there, uh, uh, where subsidence hua hai. So what do we do for controlling severe soil erosion in this this uh, areas? Engineering measures, okay. Uh, like here, you can see a series of check dams have been created. The check dams are created like this by uh, keeping some barriers of rocks and debris, so that the solid material gets arrested over here and the water just flows out. I'll show you more pictures. Yeah. These are the things which are done to check the erosion of the overburden dumps, cribs and gabion. Cribs are like this, series of small check dams which just control the erosion of the soil. The water flows through. Gabion is like uh, creating a hollow structure over here by rocks so that when the water is falling over here, what happens? Uh, the impact of the water does not loosen the material over here rather the water directly falls over on the rocks and it is buffered by the rocks finally the water flows out and the solid materials get deposited over here and periodically this needs to be cleared out so these are again some of the measures for technological reclamations another thing is tow wall and garland drain now when the water will come through the slope what will happen if we do not have proper drainage system, then this will just carry out the soil materials, the rocks and debris and everything over there. So tow wall and garland drain, these are made in the overburdened dumps so that the water just flows out through these drains. This is again a tow wall to check erosion. Uh, this is a garland drain and this is a tow wall. Here you can see construction of garland drain is going on. Uh, this is again a, a mining facility of Coal India Limited. Another thing that is often done, geotextile application. Uh, it's just like rag, you know, uh, jute rag. All of us have seen jute rags. So uh, something specialized, more specialized than jute rags. Geotextiles, these are called geotextiles. These geotextiles are just laid over the soil layers of the overburdened dumps to check erosion. Here you can see the uh, layers, geotextiles. They are pinned down with the help of pins like this uh, on, on the soil so that uh, the larger materials, rocks, debris, and soil, um, uh, some sort of soil is lost, but most of the soil gets retained with the application of these geotextiles. So once all these things are done, then it's the turn for bioreclamation. Bioreclamation means planting of trees, 
And before that, in some places, as I have told you, where there is no fertility left in the soil, we uh, need to go for some dosing of uh, microorganisms, just like uh, nitrogen fixers. So nitrogen fixers are some microorganisms who can uh, catch hold of the atmospheric nitrogen and fix it into the form of nitrate so that plants can take it up. It increases fertility. So all these things comes under bioreclamation. But if, before we go for bioreclamation, we need to check the properties or qualities of the soil. If it is good, then we can go for bioreclamation. But if it is not up to the mark, we may need to add something like we need to go for mulching, we can add uh, biochar to it, we can add um, raw materials like uh, trees, twigs and branches and all these things to increase the organic content of the soil. So like this, you know, there are several parameters which need to be looked after before we go for biological reclamation. Once we see, now, okay, fine, my soil is good uh, for going for biological reclamation, then first of all, uh, either we go for microorganism seeding. I'll show you some pictures, you know. Um, yeah, this is slope stabilization by seeds dribbling. Either I go for microorganism seeding or I go for planting of those plants who have extensive root system. There are many plants, you know, see this one. This is the root system. It has quite an extensive root system. Similarly, there are some grasses like... Uh, uh, yeah, here it is. Vertiver grass. Vertiver grass, aerial portion, the, uh, the amount of the aerial portion is equivalent to the below ground portion. That means what? It has got an extensive root system. So the first thing that I need to do for reclamation of these dumps is that I have to check soil erosion and for soil erosion checking i had to go for plantation of those plants who have extensive root system so that they can hold the soil another thing that i can i, I need to do is go for legume plantation Achha, legume kuch plants uh, there are some plants which are called legumes leguminous plants um, they you know they harbor or they help these nitrogen fixers to grow in their root zone because they contain certain nodules in their roots. These nodules become the food for the nitrogen fixers. In turn, the nitrogen fixers take the nitrogen, convert it into nitrate and the plant helps the microorganisms like fungus and bacteria to remain in its root zone. So first of all, I need to go for plantation of these two types of plants which will, first of all, check the soil erosion of that place and secondly, will increase the fertility of the soil. Once the fertility of the soil is improved, then I can go for plantation of other plants. Here you can see a comparative picture of uh, seeds, dribbling, uh, seeds dribbling and after that, how plants are growing. So now, uh, question arises, what type of plants should I be planting over there for ecological reclamation. Already I have made the soil good, um, checked it from erosion. So now I need to go for plantation. When I need to go for plantation, certain things I have to keep in mind. First of all, it's always best to go for local variety of plants. In a number of Abundant mines or overburdened dumps, you will find they are planting eucalyptus and acacia and all these plants because they are very, you know, fast growing plants. But that doesn't really help. Um, it's always better, best, you can say, to go for local varieties, local plants. The plants which are going in Assam, northeastern coal mines, will not be similar plants which are growing in Jharkhand. It will not be the similar plants which are growing in Tamil Nadu. So the first thing is we need to study the local abundance of the plant species in that area. And we need to go for plantation of the, uh, reclamation of those areas by plantation of local varieties.
Now, out of local varieties also, there are so many species. Which species would I be choosing? The choice depends on certain factors. Like, the first choice is, the plants should be tolerant to heavy metals in the soil. Because in most of the mining areas, heavy metals in soil is a problem. So those plants which can absorb heavy metals, keep it within them, we have to go for plantation of those plants. Second thing is, when the plants will be growing up, there is a lot of air pollution in this region. So the air, so the plants should be having good air pollution tolerance. That can be calculated by some uh, experiments. Air pollution tolerance index can be calculated. So the plants which are having high air pollution tolerance index, we can go for plantation of those plants in mining areas. And third, most important is, after plantation, we need to see whether those plants can bring a sustainable livelihood for the local people living over there. You know, in many of these um, mining areas, there are several tribal villages. So again, these tribal villages would like to return to their places. So we must be going for plantation of those trees which can generate sustainable livelihood of the local people. So these are the factors which we need to consider when we go for plantation. Apart from that, these are some of the factors which we need to see when we go for biological reclamation, like timing of revegetation. Species selection, I've already discussed about species selection. Identification of seed source. Nursery development. We should have a constant nursery development for a region. Whenever I want to go for plantation, I can procure plants from there. Plantation methods should be perfect and provisioning of water facilities. So these are the things which also need to be taken care of when we go for biological reclamation. Faster growth is another factor which needs to be taken up. Uh, good biomass, heavy metal accumulation capacity, these are all the points which we need to keep in mind when we go for species selection. See, here are some pictures which shows you plantation in external dump after stabilization. Uh, plantation on backfill dump. These are real pictures. Uh, before afforestation and after afforestation, the same area. Before reclamation, and this is uh, on the process of reclamation. It's going on after biological reclamation. Biological engineering results. So we can go for, uh, we can really. Uh, Again, bring back, if not 100%, uh, maybe something near to that uh, originality of the land after mining by sustainable technical and biological reclamation processes. These are aftercare and maintenance of the reclaimed site, like uh, reduction in survival rate, agar hai, so dead plants need to be replaced provisioning of water in the drier area. So these are the things, physical monitoring, monitoring of nutrient accumulation, biological monitoring, anthropogenic disturbance, if there is some, we need to curtail that. Overgrazing should not be permitted in the initial phase. Illegal timber failing cutting should be avoided. These are some of the case studies of pepperware areas of uh, CCL, where uh, many species has been tried, okay. Uh, you know, if you go to the website, you can find out a list of these plants which can be planted for uh, ecological restoration. In some of the areas, you can see here, I think some messages are coming. Uh, since I'm having full screen, I cannot see the message. See. I think my time is up. Do I get some messages? Uh, no. Okay, I'll continue. So here you can see it's a paddy cultivation on reclaimed area of Nellore coal mining areas. Even in some places, banana plantation has been done in NLC mines. So 
that's all uh, i just tried to give uh, an overview or you can say an introduction into the ecological restoration process of mining areas and uh, this is our institute birla institute of technology and in our department we work on various aspects of civil as well as environmental engineering uh, we also run a pg course in environmental science and engineering so if students are interested you can uh, just visit the website and you can find out the profile of our institution and our department and thank you all for your patient hearing thank you thank you uh, dr shukolan chakraborty associate professor and uh, sir um, uh, we are very thankful to you uh, for your precious time and uh, because uh, you are too busy also and on behalf of birla college and coach bihar college uh, we are really lucky that we have uh, with you and uh, sir uh, one question is there only uh, um, uh, priya pal singh uh, she asked that sir which mining process is more harmful for the nature and why okay okay um priya uh, uh, you know um, uh, are you asking about open cast mining or underground mining or you are sir priya pal singh are you here uh, yeah, yeah 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 uh you know both the mining processes have their own disadvantages and limitations uh effects are different when we say about open cast mining uh more land disturbances land use land cover changes that happens due to open cast mining but when we talk about underground mining uh it leads to more subsidence incidences so uh um, you know um, effects are different for both underground as well as open cast mining so <laughs> um quantitatively i cannot give a definite answer for this but yes both the mining processes are having several disadvantages like this unless and until we practice sustainable mining practices even in underground mining you know we have the uh, yeah, room and pillar mining method but we often uh, follow that room and pillar mining method because we want to extract more and more out of it and so what happens we keep the we 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 diminish the size of the pillars so what happens finally there is subsidence so it depends on what type of mining practice is being done and uh, uh, how is it being done that determines uh, which one is more risky i hope i could uh, suffice you thank you can. sir thank you thank you uh, thank you sir and uh, we are very thankful to you uh, dr shukolan chakraborty associate professor department of civil and environmental engineering uh, birla institute of technology and those uh, those who are watching the participant they can join this eminent institute sir i have already uh, uh, told that uh, there are too many uh, departments are there and it's a very eminent institute and we are very fortunate that we have got you thank, thank you. you thank you sir thank you thanks to all uh, now thank you uh, now the time to welcome uh, mr uma shankar uh, mondol and uh, we usually uh, call him a uh, mangrove man uh, the man behind the uh, the all the things in sundarbans and so uh, before that i want to read out his uh, short bio For many years Mr Uma Shankar Mondol has taught in uh, Jongipur High School Murshidabad his subject was geography which actually changed his living and outlook in many ways being born in a remote area in Sundarbans Mr Mondol has worked extensively in the field of restoration nature and planting around 6 and 1/2 lakh mangrove trees in the last 12 years under his own initiative we find in different literature he is often referred to as a friend of forest a mangrove man and we honor him for his constant rendering of selfless 
सर्विस इन द कॉज ऑफ नेचर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ बेल्डा कॉलेज एंड कोच बिहार कॉलेज आई हार्टली वेलकम यू टू दिस इवेंट एंड आई एम श्योर ऑल ऑफ आस आर ईगरली वेटिंग टू हेयर फ्रॉम यू सो विदाउट स्पेयरिंग ए मोमेंट आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर मंडल टू बिगन बिगिन हिज टॉक मिस्टर उमर शंकर मंडल आर यू हेयर I am requesting uh, uh, the Richard Kerry and Dr. Shukolan Chakraborty if you uh, be with us, uh, if it's possible for you. Mr. Omar Shankar Mondol, you need to unmute yourself, please. Sir, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, uh, sir, may I pr start presenting please. your presentation? Ah, uh, presentation. I uh, need to share. Koro na. I am in Bangladesh. I will say. आंतरिक भलोबा रही जुड़े कर रवींद्रनाथ आज के प्रयान दिवस रवींद्रनाथ सब समय कार्यकलाप सब समय पेतम तो आज के आलोचना प्रथम प्रयान दिवस रेखे भक्ति उपहारे एने शुभ प्राण समारोह आज ही नाही प्रयोजन दिन पूजा दिन आयोजन आशीषर बाणी वितर वितर सवार करुणा कर गान रवींद्रनाथ के आहवान कर सुंदरबने साल सुंदरबन ऐड़े आज शांति निकेतन उद्देश्य आवींद्रनाथ बेकन बांगल के केंद्र कर सर डैमिल डैमिल्टन क्योंकि अनेक कि नतून चिंता भावना तैरी कर परवर्तकाले देखते तब मूल विषय टाइम दक्षिण पूर्व दिखे एकदम शेषतम ग्राम हल चरघेरी सजिया द्वीप चरघेर ग्राम आज ग्राम हमारा सुंदरबने भाषा बोले भेड़ी बांगलेश साले तक दृश्य मध्य प्रचंडी 
खूब मान रोदे प्रचंड रोदे तीव्र रोदे शुकाल सीम टा को शुके परवर्तीकाले मेसेज करते प्लीज हेल्प मि फूड क्लथ एंड मेडिसिन जो परिचित लोक जन छ प्रबंध बल मानिकल बेदन फिर पेचन त प्रचुर लोक जन कून मासस्त्र मेडिकल टीम नदी बाल ढोके अनेक तर्क वितर्क है चोखे देखा अनुभूति शेयर कर प्रचुर लोक जन दरकार समय सपेक्ष मान आज लगाल कल के छवि तला मैनग्रोव लगाल विषय सरकम ही नदम दीर्घ मेहदी क्या जोर जले जोर जल ये छोट बल्ला तो प्रचुरे जोर जले की बीज भेसे आविशन गति कार्बन शोषण कर कार्बन व्यापक कार्बन से शुद्म सुंदरबन क्योंकि बेच रहे जोर जले भेसे आला हम जर अंगम जैकेशन बला कलेक्शन दो फुट अंतर अंतर बीज गो बसिए दिए ग्रोथ बोला ग्रीनारि बोला 
হেলথ বলা যেতে পারে সেটা কিন্তু অনেক বেটার দেখুন গাছে এটা কিন্তু দশ সালে এবং বারো সালে গাছ কিন্তু তখন আস্তে আস্তে হয়ে গেছে এখানে আর একটা জায়গা তৈরি করছি আমি এটা হচ্ছে হর্ষ ক্রাফ কনজারভেশন এরিয়া হর্ষক্রাফ হর্ষটা কি হর্ষটা হচ্ছে রাজ কাঁকড়া আপনি দেখবেন কলকাতা বা বিভিন্ন জায়গাতে রাস্তাঘাটে ওই বাতের তেল বিক্রি হয় ঠিক আছে কিন্তু এটাই হচ্ছে হর্ষক্রাফের তেল আর কি হর্ষক্রাফ হচ্ছে এমন একটা প্রাণী রাজ কাঁকড়া যেটা বহু বছর কয়েক কোটি বছর আগে যারা পৃথিবীতে এসছে তার আকৃতিগত ভাবে তার কোনো পরিবর্তন না হওয়ার ফলে এখন কিন্তু ঠিক আছে মজার ব্যাপার হলো এই হর্ষক্রাফের যে রক্ত আছে সেটা দিয়ে আমরা যে ওষুধ খাই দৈনন্দিন জীবনে যে ওষুধ সেই ওষুধের কিন্তু এক্সপায়ারি ডেটটা কিন্তু নির্ধারিত করা হয় তাহলে এর গুরুত্বটা কিন্তু খুব সাধারণ কিন্তু আমরা কিন্তু সেইভাবে একে সংরক্ষণ করি না বা কিছু করি না আমার হঠাৎ মনে হয়েছে তাই আমি এটা করা শুরু করেছিলাম পরবর্তীকালে আমি জানতে পেরেছি যে এটা নাকি ব্যক্তিগত উদ্যোগে সব থেকে বেশি নাকি একটা মানে ব্যক্তিগত উদ্যোগে প্রথম নাকি আমি এটা করে এটা কিন্তু একটা কনজারভেশন এরিয়া আমি কিন্তু কখনোই এদেরকে ধরে রাখিনি কিছু এই বাইনের কাছে যখন ছোট ছোট বাম কেওড়া ধুদুল পশুর গেউয়া কলসি একটা গাছে যখন দুই ইঞ্চি তিন ইঞ্চি করে শ্বাসমূল বড় হয়েছে যাকে ইংরাজিতে বলা হয় নিমটা বড় হয়েছে তখন কিন্তু পরিমাণে এই হর্ষ ক্লাব কিন্তু আস্তে আস্তে ওখানে থাকতে পেরেছে এবং তাদের বাসভূমি বানিয়ে পেরেছে হ্যাবিটেড টাইপের হয়ে গেছে ওরা আমরা অনেকেই জানি যে নদীর মুখে যখন তার বা ইল জাতীয় মাছ থাকে শীতকালে এরা কিন্তু সমুদ্রগামী হয় মাছের ক্ষেত্রে যেমন আমরা ক্যাটাগাম তো এরা কিন্তু এই সমুদ্রগামী হয় অদ্ভুত ব্যাপার আপনারা যে কেউ পরীক্ষামূলক ভাবে ডিসেম্বর মাস এবং জানুয়ারি মাস এবং নভেম্বর মাসে এই চরঘিরি চলে যাবে দেখবে প্রচুর পরিমাণে দেখতে পারবেন পর্যাপ্ত এটুকু আমরা বুঝতে পারছি যে ওই হর্ষ ক্লাবের কিন্তু তৈরি হয়ে গেছে সে তার পর্যাপ্ত পরিমাণ খাবার করতে পারে তার একটা ফার্টিলাইজেশনের জায়গা তৈরি হয়ে গেছে সুন্দর একটা কারণ জায়গাটা আচ্ছা নেক্সট ম্যাডাম নেক্সট ম্যাডাম এই দেখুন কিভাবে এই যে গ্রামের গ্রামের মহিলাদেরকে এবং স্কুলের বাচ্চাদেরকে এই যে দেখতে হাড়ি পড়া রয়েছে এটা হচ্ছে শান্তিগাছি হাই স্কুল এবং এই যে মহিলারা দেখছেন এরা সব আমার গ্রামে চরগিরি কাকারি চরগিরি গ্রামে তো আমরা কি করছি এদেরকে আমরা কিন্তু একত্রিত করেছি এবং করে একটা জায়গায় কিন্তু আমরা গাছ লাগানো এদের প্রত্যেকের মধ্যে কি দেওয়া হচ্ছে যে তোমরা ম্যানগ্রোভ লাগাও ম্যানগ্রোভ না লাগালে আমার কোনো ভাবে কোনো উপায় নেই ঝড়ের হাত থেকে বাঁচা বা মির ক্ষয়রোধের থেকে বাঁচা বা দেখা যাচ্ছে বাঁধ ভেঙে যাওয়ার হাতে কোনোভাবেই কিন্তু আমাদের আদত করা নেই আপনারা অনেকেই জানেন অতি গত বছর একটা আমপান হয়েছে এবং ইয়াসও আছে আবার যে সামনে বছর কি আসবে তার জন্য অপেক্ষা করছে আবার সুন্দর সেই বাংলাদেশই বলুন আর আমাদের বা পশ্চিমবঙ্গে সুন্দরবনই বলুন কিন্তু একটা জিনিস লক্ষ্য করেছি এই যে গ্রামীণ মহিলারা এরা কিন্তু খুব স্বতঃস্ফূর্ত ভাবে কাজ করে এবং অল্প ডিমান্ডদেরকে শুধুমাত্র কিন্তু আমি কি দেই এদেরকে কখনো আমরা শাড়ি দিচ্ছি কখনো আমরা এই মেয়েদেরকে ম্যাক্সি দিচ্ছি কখনো দেখাচ্ছে এদেরকে শারীরিক স্বাস্থ্যের উন্নতির জন্য এদের স্যানিটারি ন্যাপকিন দেওয়া হয় এবং তাদেরকে এটা সচেতন করা বারবার বোঝানো হচ্ছে তো এই রকম ধর মহিলা এবং স্কুলের বাচ্চা টোটাল প্রায় দেখা আমার সঙ্গে রয়েছে দুশো জন তো এই দুশো জন কিন্তু আমি মনিটরিং করছি সারা বছর ধরে এবং আস্তে 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 এরা বুঝে গেছে যে কিভাবে কাজ করতে হবে কিভাবে কোনটা করতে হবে অলরেডি একদম পুরো সবাই বুঝে গেছে তো এই যে জায়গাগুলোকে এইভাবে তৈরি করা মানে এদেরকে বোঝানো এদেরকে পরিবেশ সম্পর্কে বোঝানো এদেরকে এই কাজে লাগিয়ে বা তো এটা কিন্তু খুব কঠিন কাজ এটা নয় সাল থেকে আমি কন্টিনিউ করছি এখন কিন্তু অনেক বেশি ধারাবাহিকভাবে এগিয়ে গেছে পরেরটা দেখি ম্যাডাম এইটা দেখুন একটা ঘট বা লেখা রয়েছে পূর্বাশা এই জঙ্গলে দু হাজার সালে আমি যখন ওই রিলিফ দেওয়া চলছে তখন আমি মধ্যে হাঁটছি তখন দেখছি গাছের যে পাতাগুলো সেই পাতাগুলো পুরো সব নষ্ট হয়ে গেছে তো তখন একটা চিন্তা ভাবনা করলাম যে এই পাতা যখন নেই 
মাথা যখন হয়ে গেছে গ্রামেরও গেছে জঙ্গলের গেছে তার একটা বিকল্প কিছু ভাবনা ভাবতে হবে সেই ভাবনাটা কি আমি ছশো মানে সিক্স হান্ড্রেড এই মাটির ভাঁড় কিনে ভাঁড় কিনে আস্তে আস্তে ওই পুরান গাছগুলো ছিল সেই গাছের গাছে সারা জায়গায় বেঁধে দিলাম একটা টাইমের পরে দেখা গেল যে এই ভাঁড়ের মধ্যে শালিক তারপরে ছোট ছোট ওই বকের বা বক গাং শালিক বলে এক ধরনের ছোট ছোট টিয়া পাখি এইরকম আস্তে আস্তে শুরু করেছে সাম্প্রতিক যদি চর্গি থেকেও যায় তাহলে দেখতে পাবেন যে অজস্র সেখানে পাখি মাছ লাগা থেকে বিভিন্ন ধরনের বক থেকে শুরু করে প্রচুর পরিমাণে পাখি আর একটা কারণ হচ্ছে এই জায়গাটাতে এখন বিশাল বড় চর হয়ে গেছে নদী চর যেটা বলে এবং জঙ্গলটা অতি ঘন হয়ে যাওয়ার জন্য সে এই জায়গায় চর পাটা চর পাটা মানে এক ধরনের যে জালটাকে ভাটা বেলা ফেলে রাখা হয় ওই বাঁশের মাথা তুলে দেওয়া হয় এবং ওই ভাটা বেলায় কি হয় মাছগুলো জালের পাশে এসে আটকে যায় তখন মাছগুলো গ্রামে ধরে বর্তমানে এগারোটা জাল ধরে ওই জায়গাটাতে চরগির ওই জায়গাটাতে এবং এটা কিন্তু বিশাল একটা এলাকা আমি চরগির নামটা বলছি কিন্তু একটা বিশাল সেই চরগিরিতে এগারো জন জাল ধরে সাম্প্রতিক একটা আমি সমীক্ষা করেছি সেই সময় জানতে পেরেছি যে এই এগারোটা ফ্যামিলি মাসিক তিন লক্ষ টাকা মতো প্রায় কাছাকাছি তারা ইনকাম করে তবে মাছের ব্যাপার কখনো মাছ বেশি হয় কখনো কম হয় তা আজকে বুঝুন যে এই জঙ্গলটা তৈরি হওয়ার পরে এই শ্বাসমূল তৈরি হওয়ার পরে ফেস মূল তৈরি হওয়ার মাছের খাওয়ার জন্য মাছের বিচরণ ভূমি তৈরি হওয়ার জন্য আজকের এই এগারোটা ফ্যামিলি নয় আরো প্রচুর ফ্যামিলি দেখা যাচ্ছে এইটার উপর নির্ভরশীল হয়ে যাচ্ছে তার মানে বাস্তুতন্ত্র যদি আমরা পুনরুদ্ধার করতে পারি বা দেখা একটা স্থায়ী বাস্তুতন্ত্রই কিন্তু একটা স্থায়ী আয়ের উৎস হিসাবে কিন্তু আমরা ব্যবহার করতে পারি ওরা এগারোটা ফ্যামিলি খালি টাকা নিচ্ছে নয় এই মাছ পরিমাণ যোগানটা তৈরি হচ্ছে কনে কিন্তু বিভিন্ন গ্রামে চলে যাচ্ছে এবং সে কাকদা চিংড়ি চাপড়া চিংড়ি হন্ডে চিংড়ি পার্শে মাছ ভেটকি মাছ আপনার মাঠ ক্রাপ থেকে শুরু করে বিভিন্ন ধরনের ইল মেলে বলে এক ধরনের মাছ আছে এই মাছগুলো দেখে গোসবা হয়ে সোজা ক্যানিং কলকাতায় কিন্তু তারা পাঠাতে পারছে বেশি দামে আমার বাড়ির পাশে কাঁকড়া চাষ করছে সেই কাঁকড়া যায় চায়নাতে হংকং এ মালয়েশিয়াতে আমি এটা কল্পনাই করতে পারি না যদি এখন করোনা এখন বন্ধ হয়ে গেছে এটা কল্পনা করার বাইরে মানে কি আপনার ইকো সিস্টেম যদি ঠিকঠাক থাকে তাহলে কিন্তু স্থায়ী লোকের কিন্তু ইনকামের বিভিন্ন রকম পথ কিন্তু খুলে যাবে পরেরটা দেখি ম্যাডাম ম্যাডাম পরেরটা এই দেখুন আপনার ডান দিয়ে দেখুন একটা মাছ ছোট মাছ একটু পাকনা তুলে রেখেছে ফিন ওটা এটাকে বলা হয় মার্সক্রিপ যারা বায়োলজি আছে তারা জানতে পারবেন এটা হচ্ছে মার্সক্রিপ বলে এই মার্সক্রিপ কিন্তু ওখানে অনেক কমে গেছিল মানে কমে গেছিল মানে প্রায় মাটিটা এমন ভাবে ওই জায়গাটা ভেঙেছিল তারপর মাটিটা এমন ভাবে খাওয়া গেছে তারপরে গাছ নেই পুরো ব্যাপারটা যেন একটু পুরো ক্ষত হয়ে গেছে এই মার্সক্রিপ কিন্তু এখন প্রচুর পরিমাণে ওখানে দেখা যায় এবং এই মার্সক্রিপ গ্রামের লোকেরা খায় এমনি সাধারণ নিচে দেখুন একটা লাল কাঁকড়া এটা হচ্ছে বলা হয় রেড ফিডলার ঠিক এই রকমই রয়েছে ব্লু ফিডলার ইয়ালো ফিডলার এই ইয়ালো ফিডলার আছে ব্লু ফিডলার পাশে দেখুন একটা কাঁকড়া রয়েছে একটা ডাল ধরে রয়েছে এটাকে বলা হয় গেছো কাঁকড়া তো আপনি গেছো কাঁকড়াও দেখতে পারবেন আবার সুইমিং ক্লাবও ওখানে দেখতে পাবেন ঘোষ ক্লাবও রয়েছে পাশে দেখুন একটা ছোট এই সাপটা দেখছেন এই সাপটা হচ্ছে ডক ফেস ওয়াটার স্নেক কুকুর মুকুর সাপ বাংলাতে বলে আবার আমি আমাদের ওখানে সুন্দরবনের ভাষা বলা হয় জল কেরালি সাপ তো এই যে এই যে মানে আপনার দেখছেন যে প্রাণীগুলো এগুলো কিন্তু আয়লা হওয়ার পরে কিন্তু একদমই কমে গেছে 
এই রেজিস্ট্রেশন হওয়ার পরে কিন্তু এগুলো কিন্তু এখন যথেষ্ট পরিমাণ বেড়েছে মানে একদম চোখে পড়ার মতো তারপরেরটা দেখি ম্যাডাম এইটা দেখুন একদম উপরে বা দিকে যেটা রয়েছে সেটা হচ্ছে হর্ষ ক্রাপ যেটা বলছিলাম রাজ কাঁকড়া নিচে দেখুন একটা কাঁকড়া রয়েছে এই কাঁকড়াটার নাম হচ্ছে লজ্জাবতী কাঁকড়া আর ডান দিকে যে সাদাটা রয়েছে এটাকে জমরা ওখানকার বাসায় এটা হচ্ছে জোক এবং নিচে যেটা দেখেন এটা কিন্তু আপনার জেলিফিশ এবং সি অ্যানিমোনও পাওয়া যায় স্কুইড পাওয়া যায় আপনার স্কোর শোষা যেটা সেগুলোও পাওয়া যায় তার মানে এইগুলো বিচরণ ক্ষেত্র এক কথায় জিওগ্রাফি জুওলজি বোটানি এনভারনমেন্টাল সমস্ত সায়েন্সের কিন্তু এক কি বলা যেতে পারে জীবন্ত ল্যাবরেটরি তৈরি হয়ে গেছে এই চরঘিরি এলাকাতে এটা তৈরি করতে আমার সময় লেগেছে বারো বছর এবং কন্টিনিউ আমি কিন্তু এটা করে যাচ্ছি এবং শুধু করে যাচ্ছি না যথেষ্ট পরিমাণে অবজারভেশনে যে এর জন্য যত পরিমাণে প্রশাসনিক দায়িত্ব মানে কাজকর্ম করতে হয় সেটাও করছি বোঝাচ্ছি এবং দরকার হলে অনেক ব্যবহারও করতে হচ্ছে আর কি এরকম কাজে পরেরটা দেখি এই দেখুন এটা একটা অনুষ্ঠান এটাকে আমরা রাখি বন্ধন করি আমরা সকলে জানি তো এই রাখি বন্ধনের জন্য আমরা এখানে যেটা করি সেটা হচ্ছে ম্যানগ্রোভ বন্ধন এটা অনেকদিন ধরেই আমি চালু করেছি কিন্তু সেইভাবে কখনোই আলো আসেনি এটা গত তিন বছর ধরে আমি কন্টিনিউ করে যাচ্ছি রাখি বন্ধনের দিন আমি সুন্দরবনে ম্যানগ্রোভ বন্ধন করি এটা মহিলাদের সঙ্গে এই গাছের একটা বন্ধন তৈরি করার চেষ্টা করা হচ্ছে এর ফলে যাচ্ছে যে যখনই তারবে বা কোনো কিছু করবে তার মধ্যে যেন মমত্ব বোধ এবং তাদের মধ্যে যেন সেই সন্তান সুলভ যে ব্যাপারটা সেটা যেন এদের মধ্যেও যেন তৈরি হয়ে যায় তবে আপনাদেরকে বলি খুব ভালো খবর যেটা সেটা সুন্দরবনের গোসলাকে আমি যেখানে থাকি সেই এলাকায় কিন্তু সাধারণ মানুষ কিন্তু গাছ কাটে রাজনৈতিক ভাবে বা বাঁধ দিতে গেলে সোশ্যাল ফরেস্ট এলাকায় যারা গাছ কাটছে সেটা আলাদা ব্যাপার কিন্তু এমনি সাধারণ মানুষ কিন্তু গাছ খুবই কম কাটে আর ছাগল আগে ছাগল প্রচুর পরিমাণে ছাগল ছিল ছিল কিন্তু আয়লার পর থেকে ঘাস না হওয়ার জন্য গরু কিন্তু মানুষ আস্তে আস্তে বিক্রি করা শুরু করেছে খুব কম পরিমাণে গরু মানুষের বাড়িতে ছাগল দেখা যাচ্ছে সাম্প্রতিক বিভিন্ন গবেষণাতে সাম্প্রতিক যে এই সাত সেটে পরিবেশে ওখানে ছাগল সেইভাবে কিন্তু বেড়ে উঠছে ছাগল কিন্তু তাকে রাখা যাচ্ছে না বিভিন্ন ধরনের অসের ফলে মারা যাচ্ছে এই ছাগলের জন্য কিন্তু ছাগল কি নদীতে ছেড়ে দিত বা দেখা যাচ্ছে বাইন গাছে কেওড়া গাছে পাতা ছাগল ভীষণ ভালো খায় এবং এই পাতাগুলো খুব সফট নরম প্রকৃতির এবং ভালো খায় বলেই দেখা যাচ্ছে তারা এই পাতাগুলো ছাগলকে দিত এখন ছাগল কমতে কিন্তু মানুষের নদীতে কিন্তু খুবই কম যায় এবার এই যে প্রাকৃতিক দুর্যোগ হচ্ছে প্রাকৃতিক দুর্যোগে মানুষ নিজে বাঁচার যে তাগিদ সেই তাগিদটা তাকে নিজেদেরকে রক্ষা করতে পারছে না গৃহপালিত পশু রক্ষা করাটা তো আরো মুশকিলের ব্যাপার সেই জন্য মানুষ কিন্তু এই ছাগল গরু বা অন্য কোনো এই প্রাণী থেকে কিন্তু কিন্তু অনেকটাই পিছিয়ে যাচ্ছে আর কি ক্ষেত্রে পরেরটা দেখি ম্যাডাম এবং এটা আমরা দু হাজার উনিশ সালে করেছিলাম এক লক্ষ বিল ছিলাম আর ডক্টর আশিস বাবু আছেন আমাদের বিদ্যাসাগর ইউনিভার্সিটি উনি ছিলেন ডক্টর পনিবেশ চন্দ্র স্যার ছিলেন পরে রাজমৌলিক রিসার্চ গবেষক আর আমি রয়েছে এটা হচ্ছে অভিযান আমি নাম দিয়েছিলাম ও নারী সামাজিক সুরক্ষা মানে এইটা হচ্ছে আমাদের সঙ্গে একটা কোলাবরেশন করেছিল বাংলাদেশে প্রচুর ছেলেরা এখানে গাছ লাগাতে যে কিভাবে এখানে গাছ লাগানো হচ্ছে সেই সমস্ত গুলো এই বছর আমি এক লক্ষ বীজ লাগিয়েছিলাম এবং তার আপনার পেছনে গাছের ঘনত্বটা দেখে বুঝতে পারছেন যে গাছটা কিভাবে উঠেছে মারাত্মক পরিমাণে ঘনত্ব বেড়েছে এবং তৈরি হয়ে গেছে সুন্দরবনে এই ধানি গাছ জানবেন যেখানে সেখানে কিন্তু গাছ তৈরি হয়ে যায় তার 
মানে ফ্লোরা ফোনার যে পুরো অ্যাক্টিভিটিতে সেটা কিন্তু একদম এটা কমপ্লিট জায়গাতে থাকবে আর এই ধানি গাছে কিন্তু এখানে প্রচুর পরিমাণে তৈরি হয়ে গেছে পরেরটা দেখি এইটা দেখুন আমার বাড়ির একখানে আমি যত অনুষ্ঠান করি সেই অনুষ্ঠানগুলো কিন্তু সবগুলো কিন্তু ম্যানগ্রোভ রিলেটেড মানে ম্যানগ্রোভ লাগালেই মিলবে স্যানিটারি ন্যাপকিন এটা যেহেতু মেয়েদেরকে নিয়ে আমি ম্যাক্সিমাম কাজটা করছি সুতরাং এদেরকে প্রথমে কি হয় লঞ্চে ভাঙার জন্য আমি আমার নিজের যে লঞ্চ আছে পূর্বাসা লঞ্চে লঞ্চের উপরে আমি আমার মিসেস আমার বোন কখনো আমার বউ আমার ভাইয়ের বউ আমরা বাইরে থেকে যে সমস্ত অধ্যাপিকারা যেতেন এবং টিচাররা যেতেন মন্ত বলে একটা একজন আছে চন্দননগরে তাকে প্যাডম্যান বলে ও আমার সঙ্গে যায় আমরা গিয়ে লঞ্চে আগে বা নদীর ধারে কিন্তু এরকম অ্যাওয়ারনেস ক্যাম্প করতাম বারবার করে এরকম করা হতো এখন কিন্তু এটা নদীর ধারে করি না আর লঞ্চেও করি না এটা কিন্তু এখন বাড়ির উঠানে করা হচ্ছে এবং এটা তাহলে বোঝা যাচ্ছে যে এই ম্যানগ্রোভ প্লান্টেশনের পাশাপাশি কিন্তু এই নারী স্বাস্থ্য সুরক্ষাটা নিয়ে কিন্তু আমি অনেকটা বেশি এগোতে পেরেছি এবং তাদের এই লজ্জাটা ভেঙে বাড়ির উঠানে নিয়ে আসতে পেরেছি যে এটা একটা সাধারণ বায়োলজিক্যাল ব্যাপার এটাকে নিয়ে আমরা এই চর্চাটা করতেই পারি এবং সবাই ভালো থাকার জন্য এই কাজটা আমরা করতেই পারি সেই সেই ক্ষেত্রে দেখা যাচ্ছে অনেকেই কিন্তু এই ব্যাপারে অনেকেই এগিয়ে এসছে এখন এমনও বলে যে কাজ লাগানোর জন্য আমরা যে রিলিফটা দেই বা কোনো কিছু একটা খাদ্য সামগ্রী বা দেখা যাচ্ছে কোনো বস্ত্র বা কিছু একটা দিচ্ছি বলে যে এগুলো কিছুই দিতে হবে না মাসে তোমরা যখন লাগাবে আমাদেরকে একটা করে স্যানিটারি ন্যাপকিন দেবে তাহলেই হবে তার মানে বোঝা যাচ্ছে যে বিষয়টা কিন্তু আমরা কিন্তু অনেকটা এগিয়ে গেছি এই ইকো সিস্টেম রেজিস্ট্রেশন করতে গেলে আগে কিন্তু লোকজনদেরকে আমি যেখানে করছি আর কি সেই জায়গাটার লোকদের কিন্তু ইনভলভমেন্ট করাতে হবে এইবার আগে টাকা দিয়ে ইনভলভমেন্ট করাবেন না আমার এই মডেলে ইনভলভমেন্ট করাবেন এটা কিন্তু অনেক ব্যাপার কিন্তু আমার এই মডেলটা কিন্তু অনেক কঠিন অনেক কঠিন কিন্তু এই দুশো জন লোকের বা দুশো আড়াইশো পাঁচশো লোকের মন জয় করে কাজটা করতে গেলে কিন্তু অনেক পরিশ্রমের ব্যাপার আর কি নেক্সট ম্যাডাম এইটা দেখুন এটা গোসা ব্লক পড়াগার একটা স্কুল বাচ্চাদেরকে এই দিনকে জ্যাকেট দেওয়া হয়েছে এবং কিছু বই খাতা উপহার দেওয়া হয়েছে তার মাঝখানে আমার একটা ছবি এরকম পাঁচশো বাচ্চাকে আমরা শীতকালে এরকম প্রত্যেক বছরই হয় এদের এই যে বাচ্চাদের দেখছেন এই বাচ্চাদের দেওয়ার উদ্দেশ্য হচ্ছে এই বাচ্চাদের মায়েরা কিন্তু এই ম্যানগ্রোভ প্লান্টে যুক্ত ম্যানগ্রোভ প্লান্টেশনের সঙ্গে যুক্ত তাদেরকে ভালোবাসতে পারি তাদেরকে কাছে তাহলে কিন্তু এই পরিবেশে আর উন্নতিটা কিন্তু আমরা দেখতে পাবো সেটা ভাবে কারণ এরা অল্প শিক্ষিত অল্প পড়াশোনা সুতরাং এদের এদেরকে এদের মতো করে আপনাকে বুঝিয়ে এই জায়গাটা তৈরি করতে হবে নেক্সট এটা পূর্বাশা রুয়াল চাইল্ড এডুকেশন আমার একটা ছোট স্কুল এই স্কুলটা আছে আপনার কাকমারিতে কাকমারি আমরা অনেকেই শুনেছেন ইতিহাসের একটা বিখ্যাত যে মরিচ ঝাপি মরিচ ঝাপি ঠিক উল্টো দিকে হচ্ছে কাকমারি এই জায়গা এই যে বাচ্চাগুলো দেখছেন এই বাচ্চাগুলোর মায়েরাও কিন্তু বই ঢাতা দিয়ে এদেরকে কি হয় দিদ্যমণি আছে সেই দিদ্যমণি সারা বছর পড়া সকাল ছটা থেকে দেখা যাচ্ছে নটার সমন্ধে পড়ানো হয় এই বাচ্চাগুলো কিন্তু বয়স হচ্ছে দু বছর থেকে বছরের মধ্যে কারণ এই টাইমে আমি দেখলাম সুন্দরবনে মা বাবারা চাষবাস এদিকে এদেরকে বসিয়ে রাখা যায় তাহলে সেক্ষেত্রে কিন্তু অনেকটা ডেভেলপ যাবে তো সেই জন্য কিন্তু আমি ছ বছর মানে প্রাইমারি স্কুলে ভর্তি হওয়ার আগ পর্যন্ত কিন্তু এদেরকে আমি এখানে আটকে রাখার মানে এইভাবে আটকে রাখার একটা কিন্তু প্ল্যানিং করেছি পরেরটা দেখি ম্যাডাম 
এটা দেখুন পূজার সময় ওদেরকে হচ্ছে এরা প্রত্যেকেই কিন্তু ওই ওই স্কুলের বাচ্চা এবং গ্রামের যারা ম্যানগ্রোভ প্লান্টেশনের সঙ্গে যুক্ত পরেরটা हजबैंड मान स्वामी बागे मान टाइगर उठो एक कथा टाइगर उठो তো এদেরকেও কিন্তু আমি একটা জায়গাতে নিয়ে এসেছি এবং জায়গাতে বলতে বাড়িতে নিয়ে আসি সব প্রত্যেকটা অনুষ্ঠানে তাদেরকে এই কারণের জন্য ডাকা হয় এদেরও শীতকালে কম দেওয়া হয় বাট এখানে একটা মজার ব্যাপার আছে এদের কিন্তু ছেলে মেয়েরা বাড়ির মাথা যদি আছে এই কাজ করতে যদি ইন্টারেস্টেড হয় তাহলে আশা করো বাড়ির যারা নতুন নতুন প্রজন্মের যে ছেলে মেয়েরা তারা কিন্তু একবার হলেও কিন্তু পার্টিসিপেট করবে এটা আমার বিশ্বাস এবং এই বিশ্বাসে কিন্তু আমি কিন্তু অনেকটাই সাকসেস করতে পেরেছি কাজে লেগেছে মানে মেয়েরা এনাদের বৌমারা এনাদের ছেলেরা নাতি নাতনিরা সবাই কিন্তু আজকের এই বিষয়টা কিন্তু জড়িত নেক্সট এটা দেখুন এটা দেওয়ার পদ্ধতি মানে আমরা আমাদের লঞ্চে করে আমরা এই যে সুন্দরবনে রিলিফ দেওয়া আছে এরা কিন্তু প্রায় ম্যানগ্রোভ যেখানে আমার প্লান্টে তার সব সাইডে গেছে এখানে দুটো তিনটে জিনিসের জন্য এইটা রাখা রয়েছে একটা দেখুন যে যে পাশে একটা রাস্তা মানে রাস্তা না এটাই বাঁধ এই বাঁধটাকে সুন্দরবনের লোকেরা বলছে কংক্রিট কিন্তু এটা কিন্তু কংক্রিটের বাঁধ নয় এটা হচ্ছে ইটের ব্লক করা আছে ব্লক করে নদীর পারে লাগানো আছে फले फाटे नदी ताबस्था करते व्यवस्थार मध्य अन्न कि चिंता भावना लगे से चिंता भावना टाइम मैनग्रोव प्लान मानुष से मानुष ठीक थो এটা দেখুন চর গিরির চর পেছনে দেখেন গাছের একটা সারি ভীষণ বড় বড় গাছ হয়ে গেছে এটা দু হাজার উনিশ সালের একটা পিকচার এই সময় আমরা কাজ করেছিলাম যে পুরো দ্বীপটাকে আমরা পরিক্রমা করেছিলাম সেই পরিক্রমা করে আমরা বার করেছিলাম যে সেইখানকার আত্মসামাজিক প্রেক্ষাপটের সঙ্গে এই এই যে এবং জঙ্গলের যে ইকোসিস্টেমটা সেইটার কি সমস্যা আছে না আছে তা একটা সামারি তৈরি করেছিলাম বিশ্বভারতীর ভূগোল ডিপার্টমেন্টে মহাপ্রভু আছে বঙ্গরত্ন এখানে প্রশান্ত বাবু রয়েছেন এবং ছেলে মেয়ে দেখছেন এরা কিন্তু একদম সেই দার্জিলিং থেকে শুরু করে সুন্দর সবাই প্রায় গবেষক কিন্তু এখানে এই গবেষণায় সবাই লুপ্তে এটা হচ্ছে চরগিরি এই চরগিরির চরে আয়লার পরে কিন্তু অনেক অনেক ইয়ে দেখা যেত না যে ছোট ছোট জেলি ফিস সেগুলো দেখা যেত না এবং পরবর্তীকালে কিন্তু আস্তে 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 জেলিফিস ওই মার্সক্রিপ তারপর হর্ষ ক্রাপ বিভিন্ন ধরনের ইল মাছ ছোট ছোট ইল মাছ এইগুলো কিন্তু আমরা কিন্তু এখানে কিন্তু এখন পাই গেলেই আপনারা ওখানে দেখতে পাবেন তবে এটা বর্ষার দিকে বেশি ইয়ে হয় আচ্ছা পয়েন্ট এইটা দেখুন এই যে ভাই এই গাছ কিন্তু সুন্দরবনে লাগাবো বলেই লাগানো যায় না নির্দিষ্ট সময় ভাটা বেলাতেই কিন্তু লাগানো হয় দেখুন এইটা কোদাল দিয়ে কেটে নিচ্ছে এটাকে সুন্দরবনে বাংলায় খুবই কাটা আগে একজন কেটে রেখেছে সেইটার উপরে একটা হালকা মানে সফটটা ওখানে পড়ল পড়ার পরে গাছটা একবার লাগানো হচ্ছে মানে চারা নয় চারা লাগানো হচ্ছে এটা বীজ নয় কিন্তু এবং মহিলারা এইভাবে কিন্তু লাগায় এবং সেখানে এক ফুট দেড় ফুট কিন্তু এরকম থাকে 
পয়েন্টটা ম্যাডাম ম্যাডাম পয়েন্টটা হ্যাঁ এটা যেমন একটা কাজ মানে আমাদের এই যে কাজগুলো আমরা করি এই ম্যাঙ্গ্রোভ ইকোলজিক্যাল ডেভেলপমেন্ট করার জন্য বা দেখা জন্য এনভারনমেন্টালে বিভিন্ন রকম বেনিফিট আমরা নেওয়ার জন্য পাশাপাশি মানুষকেও কিন্তু আমাদের ডেভেলপ করার জন্য অনেক কাজ করতে হবে এইটা দেখুন ব্লাড ডোনেশন ক্যাম্প অন বোর্ড এটা সুন্দরবনের একটা প্রথম সরকারি নির্দেশ সরকারি সাহায্য নিয়ে আমরা প্রথম করেছি গত বছর আমরা করেছিলাম কিন্তু এবছর সব থেকে বড় পরিমাণ এটা করা হয়েছে এবং এটা তাদেরকে যারা সাহায্য করেছিল সেটা হচ্ছে বিডিও মানে ব্লাড অর্গানাইজেশন কুচবিহারের একটা অর্গানাইজেশন কুচবিহার জলপাইগুড়ি শিলিগুড়ি এবং আলিপুর দুয়ার পর্যন্ত এবং সারা ওদের শাখা আছে ওদের এবং আমাদের এই অর্গানাইজেশন দুটো অর্গানাইজেশন মিলে অন বোর্ড মানে বোর্ডের ওপরে এরকম ব্লাড ডোনেশন ক্যাম্প এবং এটা আমার সম্ভব মনে হয় ব্যক্তিগত ভাবে হয়তো ভারতবর্ষের প্রথম সুন্দরবন তো অবশ্যই প্রথম এবং সামাজিক কাজগুলো কিন্তু আমাদের এগিয়ে যেতে হয় এই ইকোলজি ডেভেলপমেন্ট করার জন্য পয়েন্টটা ম্যাডাম এগুলো আমাদের পত্রপত্রিকায় বেরিয়েছে এই সময় বা আনন্দবাজারে যেগুলো বের আমাদের কাজকর্মগুলো পরেরটা এটা উত্তরবঙ্গে বেরিয়েছে পত্রিকাতে বেরিয়েছে তারপরেরটা এবার আমি এই বিষয়টা অনেকেই মনে হয় ইংরেজি ভার্সনে রয়েছেন আমি মানে আমার স্পিকিং ততটা ইংরেজিতে সাহায্য করে নয় আমি মূল বিষয়টা আপনাদেরকে একটু বলে দিচ্ছি ম্যানগ্রোভস নিয়ে ম্যানগ্রোভ নিয়ে অনেক প্রশ্ন আছে সেই নটা প্রশ্ন কিন্তু আপনাদেরকে বলে দিচ্ছি একটু ম্যানগ্রোভ ফরেস্ট আর ম্যাঙ্গলস আর এ টাইপ ইনিশিয়াল দ্য ওয়েট ল্যান্ড অফ ইকো সিস্টেম দ্য ওয়াটার ফ্রম দ্য পর্তুগিজ ওয়াটার ইংলিশ ওয়াট গ্রোভ used to trees in the scarps that are the found the shallow up to muddy areas they replace settlements tropical the subtropical regions they are salt tor- uh, tolerant and forest wetland at the interface between a terrestrial landscape and the marine environment the dominant vegetation are several species of the mangrove woody trees scarps with a thick and particularly exposed to the, the roots and the growth the down from the branches, water and sediment. They settle where there are the little wave action and where muddy sediments accumulated while the growing mangrove forest hot reduce waves and the increase of sedimentation. Energy reduction can be the greater than 50% average and increase the width increasing offshore wave heights mangles are therefore fulfill an important coastal protection of function collect মানে স্পেশালি যেগুলো আমরা লাগাই আর কি বাইন এভিশনিয়া কাকড়া হচ্ছে বুরুগরিয়া গোজন আইজোফরা প্রসুর জায় এক্সালপাস সুন্দরী হচ্ছে হেরিটেজিয়া গেওয়া হচ্ছে এক্সালিয়া গরান হচ্ছে সুন্দরবনেজেস Filled and applied the distance of two feet is it goes as usual. It is the easy to attend. It went to up the current weather. There is the excess and sealed. One has the keep tie. Whether one is the wasting the fishing. Who is one of the adventures, seeds or tree plantation? Basically, seeds are the adventures because the seeds can easily able to the adopt first with the environment and good for the growth of the mangrove. But tree, the plantation is time-consuming and deep 
to adapt with the environment and eat the same time the exp uh, expenditure as the cost of the comparatively next was why are you worshiping the mango trees in same time trees are the worshiping as god nowadays uh, this culture is the comparatively low sundar one i am trying to get the back this culture in subsequently it the helps to make the unity between the trees and the human beings why do the mangrove bandhan actually aim of this work is to set up the intensive relationship between the local villagers and groups at the same time it helps to the balance the mental health and the stability in the difficult situation like natural calamities flood cyclone storm etc many women are working what do you they, uh, what do they pay as uh, pay as they are the remuneration the local village women's the gift ration sari kit cloths books sand napkins foods and so others they are at the remuneration how the idea comes in your mind to plant the mangroves during ayla embankments and local settlements or households the completely affected the people getting helpless so first idea in my mind was relief and then came the idea mangrove plant besides the embankments and it helps to the reduce and induction of and i am doing to this work last 12 years the major success local area get <coughs> first of all restoration of ecosystem save the embankments and dams balance in the environment balance in the environment parvam employment facilities to the local villagers or people and development of ecotourism in areas in sundarbon thank you thank you uh, mr umar shankar mondol uh, the mangrove man and uh, he talked about all those uh, things that uh, from the very beginning uh, it's uh, all the creation of his own so we are very thankful on behalf of both bihar college and belda college to mr umar shankar mondol the mangrove man and uh, we are very thankful to richard sir is with us he is also listening to your uh, the lecture and we are very benefited by your uh, all the uh, all the presentation so thank you amra aaj konik jante parlam सुंदरबन एवं से संलग्न जो विषय निजे हाथ तैरीट विषय चाहिए आजादिका महोत्सव एर संगे इंटर रिलेटेड एक कारण कारण डायवर्स कलचार रिलिजियन जेमन आज डायवर्स लैंगुएज इट्स भेरि माच रिलेटेड उथथ आवर डायवर्स एनभायरमेंट सो उ सेलिब्रेटिंग आजादिका महोत्सव नाउ इट्स अ टाइम टू There is one question. I can take uh, one question uh, for. I don't have this. Anyone have any question uh, to Swahili ma'am? Actually, one question to uh, Richard sir, uh, and uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Swahili Choudhury, uh, Assistant Professor uh, in Sociology, Belda College, uh, to give her vote of vote of thanks. and uh, raise our question what uh, she typed in our uh, comment box to richard sir uh, thank you dr ghosh uh, thank you uh, our esteemed speakers for their uh, invigorating speech uh, i have a question for dr richard uh, sir uh, like we are coming across a new concept that is cellular agriculture like which is now being considered as a solution to protecting or rather solution uh, to exploiting the livestock so sir what is your rationale uh, 
what is your uh, take on this rationale that uh, will this cellular agriculture be uh, equivalent substitute or will it become or will, will it lead to an environmental hazard as uh, the green revolution has brought forth thank you thank you for your question can you hear me Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's a very interesting question. I, I'm not an expert on <laughs> cellular agriculture, so I can only give you a general answer. Clearly, this technology has the potential to reduce or eliminate animal suffering. And so from the point of view of animal welfare, it is very promising. It might really be a game changer. On the other hand, I would need to know more about the other consequences, particularly uh, what levels of energy use and emissions are involved in the industry, um, and also the consequences for land use. Now, in the United Kingdom, we have a great deal of um, land which is the long-term product of farming animals and particularly um, the soil is nourished by the dung from the animals which fertilizes the soil uh, as of course would happen if there were wild animals large ungulate herbivorous wild animals in herds you know but those have been exterminated in the UK, mostly there are quite a lot of deer, but uh, there there isn't a viable ecosystem that could nourish the soil without the presence of domestic farmland. So the question is, what would happen to the soil? What would be the other ecological consequences of the technology? Um, so it's not an easy answer, but for me, I'm not an expert. Uh, I do think it's a promising technology, but there are a lot of other questions to ask about it. Exactly, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think we have another question uh, to, sir, uh, to Dr. Richard. It's yes. from Peter John uh, Valesco. Due to this pandemic and continuous change in the level of restrictions in different parts of the world, how can we move forward in the preservation and conservation of our environment? Well, yes, that's another very good question, isn't it? One which is troubling us all at the moment. And I have been very, very concerned for my friends in India in the last few months. Um, and I do hope people here are, are keeping safe. Um, well, of course, in some ways, the pandemic has actually had some environmentally beneficial effects because people have stopped flying, or most people have stopped flying. And so um, emissions have been reduced considerably from travel um, and, and from um, some of the other sort of activities that have ceased. However, that can't be a long-term solution. You know, that's only a, an immediate sort of side effect, really. So what I'm wondering is whether things are going to return to their previous normality or whether this is an opening that can be a, a point of change. Um, there is some interest in the field of eco-criticism, and I can send you the links to this if, if people are interested, um, some debate about a future, an imagined future in which people in the developed world do not travel nearly as much as they used to, but nevertheless they retain a different kind of intimacy with other parts of the world by means of the internet and other social media. Um, so, so there would be a sort of paradoxical culture of a kind that we haven't experienced before, I think, which would be a mixture of restricted physical travel, but the increasing universal circulation of images and communication 
uh, what we're doing at the moment with, with, with Zoom is, is a good example. Um, and this will bring about new a new sense of environment, a new sense of how to inhabit your environment, and, and, and it will develop new forms of cultural hybridity, uh, which is a very interesting prospect. But, of course, the immediate likelihood seems to be that people will try very hard to go back to normal as soon as it's possible, as soon as the immediate danger from the epidemic has passed, you know, partly because of vaccination and partly because of... Um, the development of general herd immunity. Um, so, so that remains to be seen. That's a very important question. Is this a moment of change or not? Exactly, exactly, sir. I mean, I've not said anything that any of you couldn't have thought of yourselves, <laughs> but, 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 but it, it, it's, worth, it's worth thinking about it. Exactly. Because, uh, sir, like, uh, um, can I just exchange a small uh, thought of mine? Yes. Uh, sir, because uh, there are some uh, countries who are economically challenged. So for yes. them, compromising with their economy and then restoring or conserving the environment can pose another challenge. Yes. So that becomes uh, a real challenge and difficulty yes. for those countries, actually. Yes. That's absolutely true, of course. Mm -hmm. And that is something that uh, a properly decolonizing eco-criticism has to take into account. Exactly, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, we don't have any question in the chat box. Over to you, Dr. Shukanto Ghosh. Uh, now I would like to welcome uh, the Professor Shoyali Choudhury, IQC member and uh, respected assistant professor, Department of Sociology. Uh, Ma'am, uh, now the time for vote of thanks. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, good afternoon. I feel honored and privileged to deliver the vote of thanks and express our gratefulness towards them who helped in shaping this program. On behalf of the organizing team, I express my gratitude to the chief patron of this international webinar, Professor Dev Kumar Mukhopadhyay, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Kuch Bihar Ponchanon Borma University, Kuch Bihar, West Bengal, for his enthusiastic support. I express my heartfelt thanks to our guest of honor, Dr. Abdul Kadeh Saifili, Honorable Registrar, Kuch Bihar, Ponchanon Borma University, Kuch Bihar, West Bengal, for his valuable guidance. I would like to thank the patron and the chairperson of this international webinar, respectively, Dr. Pankaj Kumar Devnath, Principal, Kuch Bihar College, and Dr. Manobindra Mondol, Principal, Bilda College, for providing their encouragement and leadership. I express my gratitude to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Richard Kerridge, Coordinator of Research and Graduate Studies in Humanities, Batspa University, United Kingdom, Dr. Shukolan Ghosh, Associate Professor, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Birla Institute of Technology, Mesra, Jharkhand, India, Mr. Uma Shankar Mondol, Assistant Teacher of Geography, Jongipur High, Jongipur High School, Murshidabad. Despite their busy schedule, Dr. Kerridge, Dr. Ghosh, and Mr. Mondol has been kind enough to grace this occasion and share their invaluable and intellectually stimulating presentation, which I am sure has inspired our students and will benefit them. I would like to thank today's chief guest, Mr. Vinay Kumar, Regional Director, RDNSS Kolkata. I thank Professor Amul Kumar Har. Program Coordinator, NSS Unit, Kuj Bihar, Ponjanon Borma University for his valuable presence. I express my gratitude to Dr. Midul Ghosh and Dr. Oshik Panda, IQSC Coordinator of Kuj Bihar College and Belda College respectively for their timely advice and encouragement. I extend my thanks to the convener of this international webinar, Dr. Shukanto Ghosh, Coordinator, Women's Studies Cell, Program Officer, NSS Unit 2, Kuj Bihar College, I extend my thanks to the joint conveners of this program, Dr. Lipika Mondol, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of Geography, Member IQSC, Program Officer, NSS Unit, Velda College, and District Nodal Officer, Pushchi Medinipur, and Dr. Shutama Misra, Assistant Professor, Department of Sociology, and Member IQSC, Velda College. This program has been live streamed in Velda College YouTube channel, and this uphill task and responsibility has been undertaken by Mr. Shubhi Shah, Faculty, Department of Computer Science and BCA, Bilda College. 
I thank Mr. Shah for providing his consistent technical assistance when and where required. I thank my colleagues, both teaching and office of Kuch Bihar College and Belda College, respectively, for their presence and support. Finally, I would like to thank all the esteemed participants and my dear students for whom this program has been organized and without whom this program would not have been possible. Thank you once again. Stay aware, stay safe, and be kind. Thank you, uh, Professor Shoyali Choudhury. And now we, it's time to wrap up the, our international webinar. And uh, dear participant, we have already provided the for, uh, feedback link. Uh, just fill up the feedback form, then you will get the certificate. Thank you, all the uh, participants and the dignitaries, and also uh, bye. Thank you, Mr. Kavit. Thank you.